Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. January 6th was the culmination of an attempted coup. Who breathes our streets? Who breathes our streets? We were invited by the President of the United States! We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. I overheard the President say something to the effect of, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing bags away. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. Breach the line! We the rioters chanted, hang Mike Pence. President of the United States, Donald Trump, said that, quote, Mike deserves it, and that those rioters were not doing anything wrong. Donald Trump and his allies and supporters are a clear and present danger to American democracy. The January 6th committee gavels in this afternoon for what may be its last public hearing and a final chance to show Americans the role former President Donald Trump played on the day the Capitol was attacked. Welcome to this special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Well, committee members plan to show new evidence and details that get at Trump's state of mind on January 6th. We expect them to focus not only on the threat to democracy surrounding the 2020 election, but also today's ongoing threats to democracy. With me to preview the hearing are James Homan here in The Washington Post newsroom and Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill. Welcome to you both. Rhonda, what can we expect to see and hear today? What we expect from the committee today is for them to lay out what they believe is trumping at the center of the election lies from 2020, that he was directly involved with trying to undermine democracy. And they are also going to try to present as part of a closing argument uh, that there still is a threat out there. There is still a threat to our election systems and to our democracy. What is today going to look like? It's going to look a little different from what we have seen in the previous hearings. One thing is all the members of this panel will be speaking today. That's a little different from before, where we uh, used to see uh, one or two members lead questioning, and that won't be happening today, which may also underscore and give a, a tone uh, to show that this is perhaps the final hearing, at least in this manner, from this panel. There are also going to be no live witnesses, no one at the witness table. Instead, the committee plans to show new uh, evidence, documentary evidence, as well as some of the old evidence that they've put out over the summer in the public phase of their hearing. Uh, one of the things that we do know is uh, that there uh, will be new evidence. The uh, committee spokesperson said that we will learn something new. And really, that's been the theme of almost every hearing we've covered so far, is we've usually left with learning something new. So uh, stand by for that. Now, the big question that a lot of people are asking up here is, is this going to be the final hearing for this committee? We don't know that. It is being suggested that this is the closing argument. However, uh, committee spokespersons say that they will not commit to this being the final. They just don't know. And they say that this is an ongoing investigation. Now, what we do know, of course, is that this is coming about a month before the midterm elections, 27 days, actually, until uh, Election Day. And so there doesn't seem to be a lot of time for them to have something before then. And we also know that this committee's future uh, relies on the election results. If the House is uh, taken over with a majority of Republicans, we do know that Republican leaders have said that they would disband this committee. Uh, but again, we just don't know yet uh, the future of the committee. But we can certainly talk later on in the show about some of the ways and the, and the suggested things that members have said about what the future might look like for this committee. Yeah, you know, Rhonda, it's been a while since we've seen one of these public hearings. So what has the committee been doing while these public hearings have been on pause? 
That's right. Where they left off with was that last hearing in the last week of July where they talked about what Trump was doing and that almost three hour gap uh, from the end of his speech on the ellipse to uh, the violence here at the Capitol. So that's where they left off. Uh, but over the summer, and if we can show uh, the list of some of the headlines that happened over the summer with this committee, uh, the panel agreed to give 20 depositions to the Department of Justice. We don't yet know what those depositions are, who they uh, involved, but uh, the committee chairman, uh, Chairman Thompson, he did say that they uh, did extend some of their work to the Department of Justice. And that, if you remember back in the spring, that was a point of tension between the committee and the DOJ's work. We were wondering if uh, both sides uh, would sort of collaborate over their investigation. So we do know that they will be providing some of their work to the DOJ. Also, over the summer, more Trump cabinet members were interviewed by the committee while they were in this pause over August. Uh, that included Elaine Chow, who was over transportation. Uh, uh, it also it included Mike Pompeo. So we saw the committee focus on uh, a lot of Trump cabinet members, Trump insiders. Uh, we don't yet know the details of what those depositions included, uh, but it is suggested that perhaps uh, the committee wanted to focus on attempts to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove Trump from office. Uh, and also we learned that the Secret Service turned over more documentation. You'll remember back in late July when this committee met, uh, they had asked for the text messages from the Secret Service. They did not get those, uh, for those texts from the January 5th and 6th. Those are still missing. But the Secret Service did uh, turn over emails and other communications, and that likely might be, play a key role today in some of the new evidence that we're going to see. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Hey, James, let's talk more about that Secret Service evidence and information. Uh, why has that been such a, a key source of knowledge and insight that the committee's been after? Well, that last big dramatic hearing with Cassidy Hutchinson, where she made a lot of really explosive claims about uh, what the Secret Service agents, Bobby Engel, uh, Tony Ornato, uh, told her privately after the Stop the Steal rally, uh, they basically put out word that that was untrue, that she was lying. And uh, essentially, these documents, were told, corroborate the version of events that we saw from Cassidy Hutchinson. And so there was the dispute over the text on January 5th and 6th. What ended up happening as a result of all that, and it obviously it would be nice for investigators to have those text messages from real time, uh, the Secret Service turned over more than a million pages in documents, uh, including... Uh, uh, Microsoft Teams messages, basically Slack messages, emails, other uh, planning traffic, uh, going back before January 6th and also after. Uh, and this is information that we haven't seen before. Uh, these are our emails and various messages that the committee says will, will corroborate the version of events that has been laid out in previous hearings. Let's bring Rosalind Helderman into the conversation, investigative reporter for The Washington Post, and she has followed, as James and Rhonda have, uh, this process every step of the way. Um, uh, Roz, you know, the question is, what does the committee have yet to do? Right? What, what do they still want to prove? What do the members of this committee want to show Americans? But also, what have they left sort of on the table in terms of connecting Donald Trump to what happened on January 6th? Yeah, well, one thing we've heard leading up to this hearing is that this, you know, they really want to put Donald Trump at the center of the activities that happened uh, in the weeks leading up to January 6th. Now, I have to say, I feel like that is a, a similar message to what we heard prior to pretty much every one of the previous hearings, uh, but they must feel that the new evidence they gathered uh, in this break time period uh, allows them to make something of a closing argument. Uh, that January 6th, the violence that happened that day was not unpredictable, uh, that it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that could have been foreseen, uh, and it happened as a result of the choices that were made by Donald Trump in those weeks after uh, he lost his reelection and refused to acknowledge that, uh, and that he was informed that violence was possible or even likely that day and pressed forward anyhow. Uh, one person that we know the committee was eager to talk to was Jenny Thomas, uh, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. She's a conservative activist. What do we know about their conversations? 
Uh, yeah, we know that uh, Ginny Thomas did go in for a closed door deposition. Uh, we know that unlike a lot of the depositions that have been played in previous hearings, that one was not videotaped. Uh, so we will not be see seeing actual clips of Ms. Thomas speaking to the committee. Uh, but we know a transcript was made, so they could potentially quote from her. Uh, and there's been a little bit of um, mixed sort of messaging and signaling from the committee about how important uh, they considered that deposition and the likelihood that we will hear from it today. Uh, we do know that the chairman of the committee, uh, Benny Thompson, had mentioned uh, being struck uh, by Ginny Thomas's continued belief that the election was fraudulent. Uh, that's obviously a view that is held by uh, many Americans. Uh, it is a false view. Uh, and held by many of the supporters of the former president. So one thing I know that we have uh, been told is that there is likely to be some emphasis in today's hearing on the way in which the lies that led to January 6 are continuing to undermine our democracy to this day. So you could see a possibility that they might uh, display some of those uh, uh, quotes uh, as part of that conversation, uh, less because she is a, the wife of a Supreme Court justice, but more as an example of an extremely prominent conservative active, activist, extremely prominent supporter of the president, uh, and to sort of show the way she and others continue to hold these false beliefs to this day. Mm. James, why this hearing now? I mean, you know, middle of the week, uh, on a you know, midday, not one of these primetime hearings. Why hold this hearing now? The committee is really trying to break through. The last hearing was abruptly canceled as Hurricane Ian bore down on Florida, uh, not because the members were concerned about the hurricane necessarily, but because they really want what they've discovered to, to break through to everyday Americans. And there is a sense that I've picked up from talking to members of the committee that they think Fox News is more likely to air the hearing live and uninterrupted during the day than during primetime programming when Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson have chosen not to carry the hearing. And so the hope, especially among people like Liz Cheney, is that uh, receptive Republicans will actually listen to what they have to say and that they can actually change minds. A big focus of this whole process has been less about preaching to the choir and more about trying to persuade those, uh, you know, 70 4 million, uh, some chunk of the 74 million people who actually did vote for Donald Trump in 2020. So what do we know, James, about how the public has tuned into this and whether the hearings have really broken through the noise and captured people's attention? Yeah, so we, uh, we have a, a graphic that shows the ratings uh, of how many people watched the 18.8 million on June 9th and the 17.7 .7 million on July 21st were the primetime hearings. June 28th was when Cassidy Hutchinson appeared. But for context, 24 million people watched last Sunday's Cowboys Rams game on Fox. So those are significant numbers. That's obviously it's generating a lot of uh, attention coverage buzz. It's incredibly important, uh, but it's it's less than an average Sunday football game. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges for the committee is uh, is grabbing people who might not otherwise uh, be inclined because if you're particularly interested in these developments, uh, you were probably already uh, offended by them. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to find new ways to reach those potentially receptive audiences. All right. Uh, Rhonda, we're going to hear from all the committee members, as you told us at the start of this show today. Uh, what's the significance of seeing all of them and hearing from all of them during this process? sort of uh, gives the tone that this is sort of a uh, an end or perhaps a swan song to what they have gathered so far. We do know from committee spokespersons uh, that they do plan to talk about some new things, but also go over some of the things that they have already touched on in the previous hearing. So hearing from all of them is sort of uh, hearing details in concert that does, will suggest to people watching that uh, this is sort of cumulative. It's, it's their findings. This comes before an expected report. Of course, we don't know when that report will drop. But a part of this committee, uh, the legislation that created this committee, says that they have to create a report and then they can dissolve. So uh, this may be the last time we hear from all of them, certainly in a setting like this. You know, Roz, to that point, has these hearings changed anything? We, we have, Roz, had moments where we, we've learned new information, which doesn't always happen in, in committee hearings, uh, in the public process, to be frank. Has this changed anything? 
Yeah, I, I think that the polling did show that uh, that this broke through maybe more than um, you know some Washington pundits had expected. Uh, that not everyone was paying attention, but some people were paying attention, and uh, you know they they had done a sort of effective job at revealing kind of at least one new sort of buzzy piece of information in each hearing, while also. Uh, while also kind of telling a broader story. Um, now, it's been some weeks. Uh, they have not been at the center of the news. Uh, you know, we know uh, uh, you might have some indication of, of the, the lack of effectiveness within the Republican Party by just how badly uh, Liz Cheney lost her reelection uh, campaign uh, in the Republican primary in Wyoming in August, 37 points. That's a real indication of where the Republican Party is on these issues, at least. Uh, you know, other things that have happened since we last heard from the committee uh, was the revelation of an entirely separate F FBI investigation into Donald Trump's handling of classified documents, which uh, at present feels like perhaps his more urgent legal problem. Um, but this committee has had a good track record of kind of keeping its cards close to the close to the chest, and and you know finding a way to kind of break through with at least one big headline after every hearing. So we'll have to see whether uh, they manage to do the same today. And Roz, tell us a little more about the pre former president's legal jeopardy and whether this series of hearings has added to that. Yeah, one thing that's also happened uh, since the hearing process began is there have been more public indications uh, that the Department of Justice is also conducting a wide-ranging criminal investigation, not into, not just into uh, the actual violence that happened on January 6th. Um, that's also happened. In fact, there is a trial going on right now for a group of Oath Keepers involved with January 6th violence. But uh, there have been these indications that, that the Department of Justice is also taking a wide look uh, at the efforts to overturn the election uh, led by Trump and a number of his key advisors and whether laws might have been broken uh, in the course of, of that activity. Uh, you know, we don't know where that investigation goes. Uh, the legal experts are pretty split on um, whether uh, the department could make a strong criminal case, uh, even if they could make a strong moral case around that activity. But in the meantime, Trump's got all these other problems that are unrelated to January 6th that have really been um, uh, showing showing their faces over the summer, uh, including, as I mentioned, the FBI search, uh, really dramatic search that happened of Mar-a-Lago in August uh, related to his handling of classified documents after leaving office. All right, Rosalind Helderman, thank you so much. You see there on your screen some of the officers who defended the Capitol that day, including former officer Michael Fanone, and we've seen some others. They have been here to witness uh, these hearings. Uh, we also have seen family members of, of officers who were killed uh, in the aftermath. Um, one officer lost his life in the immediate aftermath. Other officers committed suicide uh, in the days and weeks that followed. So this is very personal uh, for those men and women gathered there today. Uh, Rhonda, one name we've heard talked about a lot leading into this hearing is Roger Stone. And uh, when this hearing was on the books a couple of weeks ago, we did get an indication from Jamie Raskin, one of the committee members, that Roger Stone was someone that they were thinking about. Now, we don't know how much he'll come up today, uh, but, but there is... A, a film project that documented some of Roger Stone's movements in the time surrounding the 2020 election. Tell us about it. That's right. I actually spoke to one of the filmmakers of that project. He's a Danish filmmaker. His name is Christoph Gilbranson. He's actually going to be here today. He was on the way here when I spoke to him on the phone. Uh, he, we do believe, because of what uh, Representative Raskin has said, that they will use clips of that documentary. And just to give you a little bit of context about that film project, they started shooting it in 2018. And what Kristoff told me is that after the 2016 election, he, he was just, just so interested in uh, the election of Donald Trump and what that meant globally. He said uh, any issues with democracy in America mean something for the rest of the globe. And he decided to follow Roger Stone because he said the Stop the Steel was the brainchild of Roger Stone. So he felt he was a key figure in trying to understand the movement behind Donald Trump. Uh, so we are expecting scenes from that film. One interesting thing he did tell me that I, I could understand as a journalist, he said that he really was hesitant giving uh, 
uh, some of these clips to this committee because he said as a journalist we do our work and we publish it. We let the public uh, decide for themselves what uh, these things mean. So he had to kind of be talked into this and he said he ran out of arguments for holding back some of this footage because he said the stakes were just too high. So again, we are expecting some clips uh, of this Roger Stone film uh, to be shown today. The committee spokespersons did say that they will have some documentary evidence uh, of what, what happened before the insurrection, uh, before the 2020 election, and it's likely from this film. Thanks so much, Rhonda. You know, James, there's the question of what information Roger Stone might have about Donald Trump and about inner workings of the White House, but also there's a question of connections to domestic extremists and people who could have been involved in planning an attack on the Capitol or executing an attack on the Capitol. Absolutely, Libby. And Roger Stone is significant in that because he is potentially the conduit between those extremist groups, some of whom are charged with seditious conspiracy and Trump himself. Trump has always been very savvy about having cutouts, having intermediaries. Uh, Trump was not on the phone directly talking with uh, the rioters. As far and, as you know. Uh, <laughs> as far as we know. Uh, and, and so Stone is important to actually put Donald Trump at the center of this story. Uh, and so any evidence showing that Trump was encouraging or engaging, uh, you know, we obviously saw so much in public. Trump's tweeting, come to D.C. on January 6th, will be wild. Uh, Trump, you know, being uh, told that there were people with weapons in the crowd and saying, well, they weren't there for him uh, and encouraging people to still march to the Capitol, saying he was going to go with him. There's obviously a big body of evidence, but one of the, the smoking guns that we haven't seen yet and that the committee could offer today is this idea that directly drawing a, a link, pulling Donald Trump into this purported conspiracy, Stone may be the way in. How important is that connection, James? It's incredibly important. You know, the um, one of the big questions facing this committee is whether to make criminal referrals to the Justice Department. And we've heard evidence of multiple potential crimes that Trump may have allegedly committed. You know, the most obvious one is the is an, an effort to disrupt an official proceeding. That's what most of the people who went into the Capitol on January 6th have been charged with. It's the most minor crime. It's very unlikely the former president would be charged with that, but essentially stopping the certification of the election or delaying it. Uh, and the, the more serious charges would be that there was this seditious conspiracy. Now, there is a subcommittee of this committee, four of the members, we're gonna hear from all of them today, but four of the members on the committee are actually trained lawyers by background. Liz Cheney, Zoe Lofgren, Adam Schiff, and uh, one other, uh, Jamie Raskin. Yeah. Is the, Jamie Raskin's the fourth. And so they are kind of, there. those four have been meeting to decide uh, what to refer to the Justice Department. Should they actually make a criminal referral for the former president. There's some dispute about that. Obviously, if they made a referral, Attorney General Merrick Garland wouldn't necessarily bring charges. As Roz was just explaining, the Mar-a-Lago case uh, is, represents a much graver legal danger for the president right now. Uh, but it will be interesting to see today what they have that we haven't seen, because that could go a long way uh, in, in, in shedding light on whether they're going to be able to make a referral. You know, Rhonda, at the very beginning of this, Vice Chair Liz Cheney laid out a seven-point plan that the committee wanted to go through and prove. Talk to us about that. That's right. That was their strategy in that first prime time hearing uh, that they laid out that they have broken up their investigation into a seven part plan. And if we can bring up the graphic that shows that plan, it started with showing that Donald Trump was at the center of the election lie, uh, that he started helping spread fraud false and fraudulent information, despite what his aides, family members were telling him. We also saw uh, the pressure campaigns on the DOJ, uh, on Mike Pence to use his ceremonial role on the 6th uh, to change the election results. We also saw how local and state election officials were pressured by Trump. Uh, then there was uh, the discussion of false electoral slates that happened in a lot of the key states, Georgia, Wisconsin, uh, Arizona. Those attempts could have changed everything. And then, of of course, when all else failed, the committee said uh, violence happened, that violence on the day of January 6th. And we also learned at that last hearing uh, what Trump's frame of mind was and that he failed to intervene even when people 
told him uh, that things were, were really bad here on the Hill. Uh, so that is what the committee laid out. That's what they have presented in the previous hearings. And we are expecting shortly to hear uh, a culmination of all of those details and learn some new things as well. Thanks so much, Rhonda Colvin, who's going to leave us now to head into that very hearing room that you see right there. She'll be one of our journalists on the scene. James, uh, talk to us more about what you're anticipating today and what the committee really needs to do, because they have to sell this to the American public, uh, but they also have to build something for history and build something in terms of the congressional record and what the work of the committee will ultimately achieve. And, and that part, they've pretty clearly already done. We'll see what their report says. Uh, you know, they're ostensibly in the report going to be able to include lots of screen grabs of emails and messages and different things that they just didn't have time to put into these two, three hour hearings. Uh, so for history's sake, they've, they've sort of created a documentary record. No one's gonna be able to say uh, that Trump didn't try to overthrow uh, the results of the election, that Trump, you know, that there was no effort to invoke the 25th Amendment, those kinds of things they've really run down and a century from now that is going to be very important. But the political part of it is, how do you not look partisan? We're now less than a month before the election, uh, four weeks ago yesterday, or two days ago, and inevitably this is going to come across that backdrop. It's going to be viewed that way. And uh, Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, the two Republicans on the committee, have gone to great pains to say this is not partisan, uh, that this is about pursuing truth and following where it may. Adam Kinzinger, a Republican from Illinois who was basically redistricted out of the House, is, is retiring. Uh, this week he endorsed a bunch of uh, re uh, Democratic candidates for Secretary of State uh, in Arizona, Minnesota, uh, uh, and elsewhere, uh, not in Georgia, where Brad Raffensperger was one of the witnesses to testify. And so the result of that is there is this effort to show democracy really remains in jeopardy. They're going to argue that democracy itself is really on the ballot in some of these races uh, in, in 2022. Uh, but how do you make that point without seeming like you're being partisan in this environment? Uh, you know, Republicans are bracketing this by pointing to the inflation numbers that came out this morning, 8.2% increase in inflation last month. And uh, Kevin McCarthy put out a statement a few minutes ago saying, why aren't Democrats holding a hearing on inflation today? Obviously, that's, you know, a, a partisan argument, uh, but Republicans are trying to keep voters focused on the economy and inflation uh, and, and believe that they won't be moved by January 6th. Reminder of what we expect to see today. Uh, each committee member uh, will have time to talk today, not just the chair and vice chair. Uh, we don't expect to see any live new witnesses, but we do expect to see some evidence. We expect them to play some clips as they have been doing in the past, some new documentary evidence. Uh, James, this committee has really changed the way that information is presented through the committee process, through the hearing process. Um, could this be a model for future committees? It's, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm not sure how applicable it'll be just because uh, the fact that Republicans, non, uh, you know, the, besides Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, you don't have Jim Jordan and Matt Gates mucking things up. I mean, the partisan Republicans were offered a chance on the committee. They the leadership chose not to place members, and so the committee was able to move forward without that. And so that, you know, in terms of it being a model, next year, assuming Republicans do win the House, uh, they're immediately going to begin just tons of investigations into Biden, all sorts of things. Hunter Biden, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and uh, it will be interesting to see how they approach those. Do they try to kick Democrats off those panels? Uh, and But so I think that in terms of the search for truth uh, and the bipartisanship, which is very reminiscent of Iran-Contra, Watergate, uh, it, it has been an impressive model, uh, but it, it, it's hard to imagine uh, future congressional inquiries being like this just because it, it lacks the adversarial process of sort of uh, having people who are really on Trump's team cross-examining the witnesses. So what do we expect to see, James, in the coming weeks? You know, 26 days until the election, three and a half weeks left. What is the work the committee has yet to do? So the report was originally supposed to come out before the midterms, and now we're hearing uh, that the publication date has been pushed back, that it's just too much work to go through a million pages of documents and prepare everything and get it out before the election. 
Uh, if Republicans win the House, they will be able to disband the committee the first week of January. Uh, and so there is... But that's important. Not right after the election, after they gavel in in January exactly. as a new Congress. So there will be a lame duck session in November and December. And so they could have more hearings then, uh, but they also could put out their report you, know, you don't want to put it out the week of Christmas, but they could put out their report in mid-December. So they do have some time, but it, it will be after the midterm elections. Maybe it will seem less political if it's coming out after the midterms, uh, but it, that is different than their original plan. Let's talk about the committee members here and what, what their futures hold. Well, you know, yesterday, Elaine Luria, uh, the congresswoman, Democratic congresswoman from the Virginia Beach area, uh, she had a debate with her Republican opponent, and January 6th was front and center. Uh, her opponent uh, is, uh, is, is called for election integrity, made that a hallmark of her campaign. She actually election integrity uh, meaning quotes. Yeah. She, she called for a forensic uh, audit of Virginia's election results, which so is basically a state saying that, that results are suspect, and so should, it's more of the Trump line of exactly, things, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, Joe Biden won Virginia by ten points in 2020, and she was suggesting that maybe Trump won Virginia. So that was a, it was a very contentious part of the debate. Uh, and, and Elaine Luria was defending her service on the January 6th committee, but because of redistricting, she's actually in a more Republican district. And so th that's the most competitive race uh, in, in a general election context, obviously Liz Cheney lost, that any member on the committee faces. Uh, the other big question is if, if Democrats lose the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, would likely step down as Speaker, and Adam Schiff is rumored to be uh, in the running. He's competing with Hakeem Jeffries from New York to become the minority leader uh, for Democrats next year. And so Adam Schiff has tried to use this process to elevate his standing. He obviously was the lead impeachment manager in the first impeachment. So he's someone to keep a close eye on. And then uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger won't be in Congress next year. So Stephanie. what is their future hold? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're not the only members right. who are, who are going to be leaving after this year. Well, we see there uh, the committee chair, of course, Benny Thompson, and the vice chair, Liz Cheney, coming into the room. Uh, we will be watching them closely today, but all the committee members will have a chance to speak, and so we'll be listening to all of them. And, uh, and for some of them, this is a last high-profile moment, potentially Stephanie Murphy among them, as well as Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, uh, people who will not be serving in Congress next year. Uh, and this may be their last public hearing, James. We have yet to have that confirmed. When asked, uh, committee aides would not say whether this is a closing argument or not, but we'll certainly be treating it as that until we hear otherwise. Uh, our team with The Washington Post will be with you here during breaks and also at the end with analysis, so please stay with us throughout the day. I'm Libby Casey. Let's go into the room now. The select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Pursuant to House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material presented during today's hearing. Good afternoon, and may God bless the United States of America. Four months ago, this committee started to present our findings to you, the American people. From the beginning, we understood that some people watching those proceedings would wrongly assume that the committee's investigation was a partisan exercise. That's why I asked those who were skeptical of our work to simply to listen, to listen to the evidence, to hear the testimony with an open mind and to let the facts speak for themselves before reaching any judgment. Over the course of these hearings, the evidence has proven that there were a multi-part plan led by former President Donald Trump to overturn the 2020 election. Donald Trump lost his bid for re-election, as shown from the testimony of some of the president's closest allies and advisors. Donald Trump knew he lost. Despite this knowledge, Donald Trump went to court to contest the 2020 election, and he lost in court. The Electoral College met and declared Joe Biden the winner, yet Donald Trump continued to pull out all the stops in his attempt to stay in power. What Donald Trump proceeded to do after the 2020 election is something no president has done before in our country. In a staggering betrayal of his oath, Donald Trump attempted a plan that led to an attack 
on a pillar of our democracy is still hard to believe. But the facts and testimony are clear, consistent, and undisputed. How do we know this? How have we been able to present such a clear picture of what took place? Because of the testimony we've heard and that we have presented to you through these proceedings, because of the documentary evidence we've gathered and also made available directly to you, the American people. When you look back at what has come out through this committee's work, the most striking fact is that all this evidence come almost entirely from Republicans. The evidence that has emerged did not come from Democrats or opponents of Donald Trump. Instead, look at who's written and testified and produced evidence. Who has that been? Aides who've worked loyally for Donald Trump for years, Republican state officials and legislators, Republican electors, the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee, political professionals who worked at the highest levels of the Trump campaign, Trump appointees who served in the most senior positions in the Justice Department, President Trump's staff and closest advisors in the White House, members of the President Trump's family, his own White House counsel. I've served in Congress a long time. I can tell you it's tough for any congressional investigation to obtain evidence like what we've received, least of all such a detailed view into a president's inner circle. And I want to be clear, not all these witnesses were thrilled to talk to us. Some up put up quite a fight. But ultimately, the vast majority cooperated with our investigation. And what we've shown you over the last four months has been centered on the evidence, evidence that has come overwhelmingly from Republican witnesses. So I say to you again, as I did in June, this investigation is not about politics. It's not about party. It's about the facts, plain and simple. And it's about making sure our government functions under the rule of law as our Constitution demands. Today, as in previous proceedings, my colleagues and I will present new evidence. That includes new testimony from additional Republicans who served in the Trump administration, never before seen footage of congressional leaders on January 6th working to coordinate the response to the violence and ensure the people's business went forward. New materials produced to the committee by the Secret Service, details about the ongoing threat to American democracy. Today's proceeding will also be grounded in the facts, but it won't look exactly like all our other hearings. We'll also take a step back and look at the evidence in a broader context providing a summary of key facts we've uncovered. Facts relevant to former President Trump's state of mind about his motivation and about his intent. What did President Trump know? What was he told? What was his personal and substantial role in the multi-part plan to overturn the election? For those of you who've watched our prior hearings, some of this evidence will look familiar. For those of you tuning in for the first time, we'll summarize some of the most important facts and we'll urge you to go online and watch our hearing in full. There's one more difference about today. Pursuant to the notice circulated prior to today's proceedings, we are convened today not as a hearing, but as a formal committee business meeting so that in addition to presenting evidence, we can potentially hold a committee vote on further investigative action based upon that evidence. Before we get to that evidence, I'd recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any opening statement she care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Much has happened since our last public hearing on July 21st. As the chairman mentioned, we've received new and voluminous documentation from the Secret Service, which we continue to analyze. We've received new witness testimony, including about efforts to obstruct our investigation and conceal key facts. 
And according to public reporting, the Department of Justice has been very active in pursuing many of the issues identified in our prior hearings. Our committee may ultimately decide to make a series of criminal referrals to the Department of Justice, but we recognize that our role is not to make decisions regarding prosecution. The preamble to our Constitution recites among its purposes to, quote, establish justice. And our nation's judiciary and our U.S. Department of Justice have that responsibility. A key element of this committee's responsibility is to propose reforms to prevent January 6th from ever happening again. We've already proposed, and the House has now passed, a bill to amend the Electoral Count Act to help ensure that no other future plots to overturn an election can succeed. And we will make further specific recommendations in our final report, based in part on the evidence you will hear today. Our hearings last summer began with an outline of President Trump's multi-part plan to overturn the 2020 presidential election. We then proceeded to demonstrate each of these elements in detail, with more than 20 hours of evidence. Today, we will see new evidence, but as the chairman said, we will also synthesize evidence you've seen before. The vast weight of evidence presented so far has shown us that the central cause of January 6th was one man, Donald Trump, whom many others followed. None of this would have happened without him. He was personally and substantially involved in all of it. Exactly how did one man cause all of this? Today, we will focus on President Trump's state of mind, his intent, his motivations, and how he spurred others to do his bidding, and how another January 6th could happen again if we do not take necessary action to prevent it. As you view our evidence today, I would suggest a focus on the following points. First, as you will see, President Trump had a premeditated plan to declare that the election was fraudulent and stolen before Election Day, before he knew the election results. He made his stolen election claims on election night against the advice of his campaign without any evidence in hand. Then, over the next two months, he sought to find those who would help him invent and spread lies about the widespread fraud. Many of those who stepped forward to help, including Rudy Giuliani, knew they never had real evidence sufficient to change the election results. And on the evening of January 5th, they admitted they were still trying to find that phantom evidence. Of course, as a result of making intentionally false claims of election fraud, Mr. Giuliani's license to practice law has now been suspended. Second, please recognize that President Donald Trump was in a unique position, better informed about the absence of widespread election fraud than almost any other American. President Trump's own campaign experts told him that there was no evidence to support his claims. His own Justice Department appointees investigated the election fraud claims and told him, point blank, they were false. In mid-December 2020, President Trump's senior advisors told him the time had come to concede the election. Donald Trump knew the courts had ruled against him. He had all of this information, but still he made the conscious choice to claim fraudulently that the election was stolen, to pressure state officials to change election results, to manufacture fake electoral slates, to attempt to corrupt our Department of Justice, to summon tens of thousands of supporters to Washington. Knowing that they were angry, knowing that some of them were armed, he sent them to the Capitol. Then, as the riot was underway, he incited his supporters to further violence by publicly condemning his vice president. And then he refused for hours to disband his rioting supporters and instruct them to leave the Capitol, even when he was begged repeatedly to do so. None of this is normal or acceptable or lawful in our republic. Third, please consider today who had a hand in defeating President Trump's efforts to overturn the election. Vice President Pence, Bill Barr, Jeff Rosen, and others at the Department of Justice, state Republican officials, White House staff who blocked proposals to mobilize the military to seize voting machines and run new elections, our Capitol Police, aided by the Metropolitan Police, 
other federal law enforcement, and our National Guard, who arrived later in the afternoon. All of these people had a hand in stopping Donald Trump. This leads us to a key question. Why would Americans assume that our Constitution and our institutions in our republic are invulnerable to another attack? Why would we assume that those institutions will not falter next time? A key lesson of this investigation is this. Our institutions only hold when men and women of good faith make them hold, regardless of the political cost. We have no guarantee that these men and women will be in place next time. Any future president inclined to attempt what Donald Trump did in 2020 has now learned not to install people who could stand in the way. And also, please consider this. The rulings of our courts are respected and obeyed because we as citizens pledge to accept and honor them. Most importantly, our president, who has a constitutional obligation to faithfully execute the laws, swears to accept them. What happens when the president disregards the court's rulings as illegitimate, when he disregards the rule of law? That, my fellow citizens, breaks our republic. Finally, as you view the evidence today, also consider this. President Trump knew from unassailable sources that his election fraud claims were false. He admitted he had lost the election. He took actions consistent with that belief. Claims that President Trump actually thought the election was stolen are not supported by fact and are not a defense. There is no defense that Donald Trump was duped or irrational. No president can defy the rule of law and act this way in a constitutional republic, period. Mr. Chairman, our nation's federal judges are sworn to do impartial justice, to preserve our Constitution and preserve our union. Dozens of these judges have been addressing January 6th cases, and many have given us plain, unmistakable warnings about the direction of our republic. Let me read from one judge's statement given at a recent sentencing hearing. Quote, high-ranking members of Congress and state officials who know perfectly well the claim of fraud was and is untrue and that the election was legitimate are so afraid of losing their power they won't say so. It has to be crystal clear that it is not patriotism, it is not standing up for America to stand up for one man who knows full well that he lost instead of the Constitution he was trying to subvert. Mr. Chairman, the violence and lawlessness of January 6th was unjustifiable, but our nation cannot only punish the foot soldiers who stormed our Capitol. Those who planned to overturn our election and brought us to the point of violence must also be accountable. With every effort to excuse or justify the conduct of the former president, we chip away at the foundation of our republic. Indefensible conduct is defended, inexcusable conduct is excused. Without accountability, it all becomes normal and it will recur. So as we watch the evidence today, please consider where our nation is in its history. Consider whether we can survive for another 246 years. Most people in most places on earth have not been free. America is an exception. And America continues only because we bind ourselves to our founders' principles, to our Constitution. We recognize that some principles must be beyond politics, inviolate, and more important than any single American who has ever lived. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objections, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very uh, shortly after the election, oh, uh, we began this meeting by returning to election night, November 3rd, 2020. Uh, as the chairman noted, we've previously presented testimony about how the election results uh, were expected to come in that night in certain states 
ballots cast by mail uh, before election day would be counted only after the polls closed that evening. Uh, that meant that election results would not be known for some time. Although President Trump's campaign manager, Bill Stepien, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, and Jared Kushner had advised Donald Trump to encourage mail-in voting by Republicans, President Trump did not do so. Yeah, I just remember generally, you know, you had people arguing that we had a, a very, very robust get out the vote effort and that, you know, mail-in ballots could be a good thing uh, for us if we looked at it correctly. There was one meeting uh, that was had um, in particular. Um, I invited uh, Kevin McCarthy to join the meeting, uh, he being of like mind on, on the issue uh, with me. Mm -hmm. um, in which we made our case uh, for, for why we believed mail-in balloting, mail-in voting, um, not to be a bad thing for his campaign. Um, but, um, you know, the, the president's mind was, was, was made up. So it was expected before the election that the initial counts in some states, in other words, those votes cast on election day, would be more heavily Republican. And this would create the false perception of a lead for President Trump, a so-called red mirage. But as the results uh, of the absentee ballots that were later counted, uh, there, there could be trends towards Vice President uh, Biden uh, as those mail-in ballots were counted. Now, on election night, Donald Trump's advisors specifically told him he didn't have a factual basis to declare victory. He should wait for the remaining ballots to be counted. Here is campaign manager Bill Stepien. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Um, ballots, ballots were still being counted. Ballots were still going to be counted for days. Um, and it was far too early to be making any proclamation like that. I believe my recommendation was to say that votes were still being counted. It's too early to, to, to tell, um, too early to, to call the race. But President Trump did declare victory in the late hours of election night. Not only did he declare victory, he also called for the ongoing count of votes to just stop. Stopping the count would have violated both federal and state laws and also disenfranchised millions of voters who lawfully cast their vote. He called for that action anyway. Here's what he said. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. We want all voting to stop. We now know more about President Trump's intention for election night. The evidence shows that his false victory speech was planned well in advance, before any votes had been counted. It was a premeditated plan by the president to declare victory no matter what the actual result was. He made a plan to stay in office before election day. Now the vice president's staff was concerned with what Donald Trump might do on election night. They took steps to ensure that Mr. Pence would not echo a false victory announcement from President Trump. Here's what the vice president's counsel, Greg Jacob, told us about his preparations with the vice president's chief of staff, Mark short. Mark had indicated to me that uh, there was a possibility that there would be uh, a declaration of victory uh, within the White House that some might push for. Uh, and this is prior to the election results being known. And that he was trying to figure out a way of uh, avoiding the vice president sort of being thrust into uh, 
a position of um, uh, needing to opine on that when he might not have sufficient information to do so. Now, following this conversation, Mr. Jacob drafted a memo to Mr. Short, which the Select uh, Committee got from the National Archives. The memo was sent on November 3rd, Election Day, uh, and advised, it is essential that the Vice President not be perceived by the public as having decided questions concerning disputed electoral vic uh, votes prior to the full development of all relevant facts. A few days before the election, Mr. S uh, Trump also consulted with one of his outside advisors, inside activist Tom Fitton, about the strategy for election night. The select committee got this pre-prepared statement from the National Archives. As you can see, the draft statement, which was sent on October 31st, declares, we had an election today and I won. And the Fitton memo specifically indicates a plan that only the votes counted by the election day deadline, and there is no election day deadline, would matter. Everyone knew that ballot counting would lawfully continue past election day, claiming that the counting on election uh, night must stop before millions of votes were counted was, as we now know, a key part of President Trump's uh, premeditated uh, plan. On election day, just after 5 p.m., Mr. Fitton indicated he'd spoken with the president about the statement. Sending along again, just talk to him about the draft below. Again, this uh, plan uh, to keep, um, uh, to declare victory was in place before any of the results had been determined. In the course of our uh, investigation, we also interviewed Brad Parscale, President Trump's former campaign manager. He told us he understood that President Trump planned as early as July that he would say he won the election even if he lost. And just a few days before the election, Steve Bannon, a former Trump chief White House strategist and outside advisor to President Trump, spoke to a group of his associates from China and said this. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. And, but and that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs vote in May. And so they're going to have a natural disadvantage, and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. <laughs> also, also if, Trump <laughs> is, if Trump is losing... By 10 or 11 o'clock at night, mm. it's going to be even crazier. <laughs> you know, no, no, because he's going to sit right there and say they stole it. I'm, yeah. going to, uh, Agree. I'm directing the attorney general mm. to shut down all ballot places in all 50 states. It's going to be no. <laughs> he's not going out easy. If, Trump, if Biden's winning, mm. Trump is going to do some crazy shit. As you know, Mr. Bannon refused to testify in our investigation. He's been convicted of criminal contempt of Congress and he's awaiting sentencing. But the evidence indicates that Mr. Bannon had advanced knowledge of Mr. Trump's intent to declare victory falsely on election night, but also that Mr. Bannon knew about Mr. Trump's planning for January 6th. Here's what Bannon said on January 5th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's all converging, and now we're on, as they say, the point of attack. Right, the point of attack tomorrow. I'll tell you this, it's not gonna happen like you think it's gonna happen, okay? It's gonna be quite extraordinarily different. And all I can say is strap in. You have made this happen and tomorrow it's game day. So strap in, let's get ready. Another close associate of Donald Trump apparently knew of Mr. Trump's intentions as well. Now, Roger Stone is a political operative with a reputation for dirty tricks. In November 2019, he was convicted of lying to Congress and other crimes and sentenced to more than three years in prison. He's also a longtime advisor to President Trump and was in communication with President Trump throughout 2020. 
Mr. Trump pardoned Roger Stone on December 23rd, 2020. Now recently, the select committee got footage of Mr. Stone before and after uh, the election from Danish filmmaker Christopher Gilbranson, pursuant to a subpoena. Right before the election, here's Roger Stone talking about what President Trump would do after the election. Let's just hope we're celebrating. Oh, I, I suspect it'll be, I really do suspect it'll still be up in the air. But when that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. No, we won. Fuck you. Sorry, over. We won. Yeah. You're wrong. Fuck you. ABC. I said, fuck the Lord, and let's get right to the violence. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's no fault. I'm going to start smashing pumpkins, if you know what I mean. The select committee called Mr. Stone as a witness, but he invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified? Uh, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully re uh, declined to answer your question on the basis of the Fifth Amendment. And, and Mr. Stone, did you have any role in planning for the violence on January 6th? Uh, once again, I will assert my Fifth Amendment right to decline to answer your question. Although we don't yet have all the relevant records of Roger Stone's communications, even Stone's own social media posts acknowledge that he spoke with Donald Trump on December 27th as preparations for January 6th were underway. In this post, you can see how Roger Stone talked about his conversations with President Trump. He wrote, I also told the president exactly how he can appoint a special counsel with full subpoena power to ensure those who are attempting to steal the 2020 election through voter fraud are charged and convicted, and to ensure Donald Trump continues as our president. As we know by now, the idea for a special counsel was not just an idle suggestion. It was something President Trump had actually tried to do earlier that month. We know that Roger Stone was at the Willard Hotel on January 5th and 6th, and we know from other witness testimony that President Trump asked his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, to speak with Roger Stone and General Michael Flynn that night. In addition to his connection to President Trump, Roger Stone maintained extensive direct connections to two groups responsible for violently attacking the Capitol, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. Individuals from both of these organizations have been charged with a crime of seditious conspiracy. Now, what is seditious conspiracy? It is a conspiracy to use violent force against the United States to oppose the lawful authority of the United States. Multiple associates of Roger Stone from both the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys have been charged with this crime. Close associates of Roger Stone, including Joshua James, have pled guilty to this crime. We know that at least seven Oath Keepers who have been criminally charged provided personal security for Roger Stone or were seen with him on January 6th or in the weeks leading up to January 6th. For example, Joshua James, the leader of the Alabama Oath Keepers, provided security for Roger Stone and was with him on January 5th. This is uh, the picture of the two uh, together on January 5th. James entered the Capitol on January 6th. He assaulted a police officer. Earlier this year, he pled guilty to seditious conspiracy and, obstruct and obstruction of Congress. Another example is the married couple, Kelly and Connie Meggs. Now, Kelly Meggs was the leader of the Florida chapter of the Oath Keepers. Both he and his wife provided security for Roger Stone, and both are charged with leading a military-style stack attack of Oath Keepers, attacking the Capitol on January 6th. Perhaps even more disturbing is Roger Stone's close association with Enrique Tarrio, the national chairman of the Proud Boys. Roger Stone's connection with Enrique Tarrio and the Proud Boys is well documented by video evidence with phone records the select committee has obtained. Um, 
Tario, along with other Proud Boys, has been charged with multiple crimes concerning the attack on January 6th, including seditious conspiracy. During the attack, Tario sent a message to other Proud Boys claiming, we did that. He also visited the White House on December 12th. Later that day, he posted a disturbing video claiming credit for the attack. This video, posted on January 6th, was apparently created prior to the attack. This big lie, President Trump's effort to convince Americans that he had won the 2020 election, began before the election results even came in. It was intentional, it was premeditated, it was not based on election results or any evidence of actual fraud affecting the results or any actual problems with voting machines. It was a plan concocted in advance to convince his supporters that he won. And the people who seemingly knew about that plan in advance would ultimately play a significant role in the events of January 6th. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kingslinger, for an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Very shortly uh, after the election, the Trump campaign recognized that they had likely lost the election, and they informed Donald Trump of that fact. Even before the networks called the race for President Biden on November 7th, his chances of pulling out a victory were virtually non-existent, and President Trump knew it. Do you know if anybody ever told the president that he had lost and that there wasn't a chance of him winning? The, I know that the president, when the networks called it, of course, he was informed about the, the network uh, decision. Um, that afternoon, at some point, myself and a handful of other folks went over and sat down with the president and um, communicated uh, that the, the odds of us prevailing in legal challenges uh, were very small. You know, after the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. At times, President Trump acknowledged the reality of his loss. Although he publicly claimed that he had won the election, privately, he admitted that Joe Biden would take over as president. Here's a few examples of that. So we're in the Oval and there's a discussion going on. And the president says, I think it's, it could have been Pompeo, but he says words to the effect of, yeah, we lost, we need, we need to let that issue go to the next guy, meaning President Biden. I remember maybe a week after the election was called, I popped into the Oval just to like give the president the headlines and see how he was doing. And he was looking at the TV and he said, can you believe I lost to this effing guy? Mark raised it with me on the 18th. And so following that conversation where the motorcade ride driving back to the White House, and I had said like, does the president really think that he lost? And he said, you know, a lot of times he'll tell me that he lost, but he wants to keep fighting it. And he thinks that there might be enough to overturn the election, but, you know, he, he pretty much has acknowledged that, he, that he's lost. Knowing that he had lost and that he had only weeks left in office, President Trump rushed to complete his unfinished business. One key example is this. President Trump issued an order for large-scale U.S. troop withdrawals. He disregarded concerns about the consequences for fragile governments on the front lines of the fight against ISIS and al-Qaeda terrorists. Knowing he was leaving office, he acted immediately and signed this order on November 11th, which would have required the immediate withdrawal of troops from Somalia and Afghanistan, all to be complete before the Biden inauguration on January 20th. As you watch these clips, recall that General Keith Kellogg was the National Security Advisor to the Vice President and had served as Chief of Staff to the National Security Council for President Trump. And General Milley was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. Are you familiar with a memo that the President reportedly 
signed on November 11, 2020, ordering that troops be withdrawn from Afghanistan and Somalia? Yes. So I think you might have seen some things where um, there's a memo or something from Johnny McEntee to Douglas McGregor. Um, it says, here's your task uh, to get U.S. forces out of uh, out of uh, Somalia, get U.S. forces out of Afghanistan. When you first interviewed and met Colonel Douglas McGregor, is it fair to say you discussed this decision of withdrawing from Somalia and Afghanistan, correct? Yeah, I'm sure that was part of it, yeah. And that was the position that he was taking over there was senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Is that correct? Yes. So on that same day, just so I'm clear, he responded back to you that they, meaning DOD leadership, was not going to do take any of those steps without an order. Without a directive, yeah. I explained in, in language that should be in the order while I was in the meeting with McEntee, and this was my answer to him. I said, if you want this to happen, or if the president wants this to happen, he's got to write an order. So you and never wrote this down in any capacity? Well, I, I sketched on a piece of paper for him some key statements. Uh, you know, the president directs. Yeah. You know, this is, uh, what's the right word, boilerplate language? Who was in his office drafted the order? It was uh, myself and one of my assistants. McEntee duly types it up, brings it in to the president. The president signs it, and boom, it's over, faxed over, or emailed, scanned over to Castro, delivers it to me. Was it by auto pen, or was it the president himself signing it? It was the president. And who obtained that signature? I did. It is odd. It is non-standard. It is potentially dangerous. I personally thought it was militarily not feasible, nor wise. And I proceeded to tell the PPO and proceeded to tell McGregor that if I ever saw anything like that, um, I would do something physical because I thought what that was then was a tremendous disservice to nation. And no, by the way, that was a very, very contested issue. There were people who did not agree with getting out of Afghanistan. I appreciate their concerns. An immediate de departure that that memo said would have been a catastrophic. It's the same thing what President Biden went through. It would have been a debacle. Keep in mind, the order was for an immediate withdrawal. It would have been catastrophic. And yet, President Trump signed the order. These are the highly consequential actions of a president who knows his term will shortly end. At the same time that President Trump was acknowledging privately that he had lost the election, he was hearing that there was no evidence of fraud or irregularities sufficient to change the outcome. I remember... Um, a call with uh, Mr. Meadows, where Mr. Meadows was asking me what I was finding and if I was finding anything. And I remember sharing with him that we weren't finding anything that would be sufficient to um, change the results in any of the key states. When was that conversation? Probably in November, mid to late November. I think it was before my child was born. And what was Mr. Meadows' reaction to that information? I believe the words he used were, so there's no there there. It would be our job to track it down and, and, and come up dry because the allegation didn't prove to be true. And we'd have to, you know, relay the news that, yeah, that, that, that tip that, that, you know, someone told you about those those votes uh, or that fraud or, you know, uh, nothing came of it. Um, that would be our job as, as, as you know, the truth telling uh, squad and, you know, not, 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 not a fun job to be, you know, as much it's, uh, it's an easier job to be telling the president about, you know, wild allegations. It's a harder job to be telling him on the back end that, yeah, that's, that, that wasn't true.
what was generally discussed on that topic was whether the fraud, maladministration, abuse, or irregularities, uh, if aggregated and read most favorably to the campaign, would that be outcome determinative? And um, I think everyone's assessment in the room, at least amongst the staff, Mark Short, myself, and Greg Jacob, was that it was not sufficient to be outcome determinative. Look, it's the right of any candidate to litigate gen genuine election disputes. Nobody argues that. But President Trump's litigation was completely unsuccessful. In our past hearings, we told you that the committee had identified a total of 62 election lawsuits filed by the Trump campaign and its allies between November 4th and January 6th of 2021. Those cases resulted in 61 losses and only a single victory, which did not affect the outcome for any candidate. The claims were not supported by any sufficient evidence of fraud or irregularities. In fact, they were baseless, as judges repeatedly recognized. In none of these 62 cases was President Trump able to establish any viable claims of election fraud sufficient to overturn the results of the election. In those hearings, we shared with you the words used by judges around the country in rejecting the Trump campaign's claims. It's strong language criticizing the lack of evidentiary support for the claims of election fraud in those lawsuits. For example, a federal appeals court in Pennsylvania wrote, quote, charges require specific allegations and proof. We have neither here. A federal judge in Wisconsin wrote, quote, the court has allowed the former president the chance to make his case and he has lost on the merits. Another judge in Michigan called the claims, quote, nothing but speculation and conjecture that votes for President Trump were either destroyed, discarded, or switched to votes for Vice President Biden. A federal judge in Michigan sanctioned nine attorneys, including Sidney Powell, for making frivolous allegations in an election fraud case, describing the case as a historic and profound abuse of the judicial process. Recently, a group of distinguished Republican election lawyers, former judges and elected officials, issued a report confirming the findings of the courts. In their report entitled Lost, Not Stolen, these prominent Republicans analyzed each election challenge and concluded this. Donald Trump and his supporters failed to present evidence of fraud or inaccurate results significant enough to invalidate the results of the 2020 presidential election. On December 11th, Trump's allies lost a lawsuit in the U.S. Supreme Court that he regarded as his last chance at success in the courts. A newly obtained Secret Service message from that day shows how angry President Trump was about the outcome. Quote, just FYI, POTUS is pissed. Breaking news, Supreme Court denied his lawsuit. He is livid now. Cassidy Hutchison, an aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, was present for that conversation and described it in this way. This is the day that the Supreme Court had rejected that case. Mr. Meadows and I were in the White House residence at a Christmas reception. And as we were walking back from the Christmas reception that evening, the president was walking out of the Oval Office, so we crossed paths in the Rose Garden Colonnade. The president was fired up about the Supreme Court decision. And so you know, I was standing next to Meadow, Mr. Meadows, but I stepped back, so I was probably two, three feet caddy corner from her diagonal from him. You know, the president's just raging about the decision and how it's wrong and why didn't we make more calls and you know, just <clears throat> this typical anger outburst at this decision. And the president said, he had I put the, okay, so he had, said something to the effect of, I don't want people to know we lost, Mark. This is embarrassing. Figure it out. We need to figure it out. I don't want people to know that we lost. Our country is a country of laws where every person, including the president, must follow the law and respect the judgment of our courts. President Trump's closest advisors held that view both then and now. Well, do you believe the president should abide by the rulings of the courts? Oh, yes. We, we, we should all comply with the law at all times to the best of our, our ability, every one of us. So once the courts had ruled and the Electoral College had met 
uh, the election was over in your view? Yes, I think I think I've said previously that when the vice president made the certification and the litigation was complete, it was complete. When the electoral college met on the fourteenth. Uh, yes, it, it, as a December fourteenth, is that right? I think that's the the right date. Yes. I assume, Pat, that you would agree the president is is uh, obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts. Of course. And and I assume you also would everybody everybody is obligated to abide by rules, of course. And, and I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct? Ivanka, do you do you believe the president's obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts? I do. By mid-December of 2020, President Trump's senior staff were attempting to persuade him to concede the election outcome. But, but if your question is that I believe he should concede the election at a point in time, yes, I did. December 14th was the day that the state certified their votes and sent them to Congress. And in my view, that was the end of the matter. Uh, I didn't see... Uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, this would lead inexorably to a new administration. I told him that my personal viewpoint was that the Electoral College had met, uh, which is the uh, <clears throat> system that our uh, country is, is set under to elect a president and vice president. And I believed at that point that the um, means for him to pursue uh, litigation um, uh, was probably closed. And you recall what his response, if any, was? He disagreed. Secretary of Labor Gene Scalia, the son of late Justice Scalia, visited President Trump in mid-December and explained the situation clearly. And so I had to put a call into the president. I might have called on the 13th. We spoke, I believe, on the 14th, in which... Um, I conveyed to him that I uh, thought that it was time for him to acknowledge that uh, President Biden had uh, prevailed in the election. But I communicated to the president that uh, when that legal process is exhausted and when the electors are, have voted, that that's the point at which that outcome needs to be expected. I told him that I did believe, yes, that once the, those legal processes were run, uh, if fraud had not been established uh, that had affected the outcome of the election, then unfortunately, I believe that what had to be done was concede the outcome. Not only did the courts reject President Trump's fraud and other allegations, his Department of Justice appointees, including Bill Barr, Jeffrey Rosen, and Richard Donahue, did as well. President Trump knew the truth. He heard what all his experts and senior staff were telling him. He knew he had lost the election. But he made the deliberate choice to ignore the courts, to ignore the Justice Department, to ignore his campaign leadership, to ignore senior advisors, and to pursue a completely unlawful effort to overturn the election. His intent was plain, ignore the rule of law and stay in power. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Luria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mid-December was a turning point. President Trump made a decision, a choice, to ignore the courts and his advisors and to push forward to overturn the election. His efforts to overturn the election were not random or disconnected. Rather, they were part of a coordinated, multi-part plan to ensure that he stayed in power. Donald Trump was the driver behind each part of this plan. He was personally and directly involved. Of course, a key element of the plan was continuing to convince tens of millions of Americans that he did not, in fact, lose. Again, he did this even though his own campaign advisors and his Justice Department officials told him his claims of fraud were wrong. In this video, you'll see that even when top law enforcement officials told the president his election fraud claims were false. 
he still repeated the claims in the days and weeks that followed. Sometimes, even the I very next day. I specifically raised the Dominion voting machines, which I found to be among the most uh, disturbing allegations, disturbing in the sense that I saw absolutely zero basis for the allegations. I told them that it was, that it was uh, crazy stuff, and they were wasting their time on that. And uh, it was doing a great, grave disservice to the country. We have a company that's very suspect. Its name is Dominion. With the turn of a dial or the change of a chip, you can press a button for Trump and the vote goes to Biden. What kind of a system is this? We definitely talked about Antrim County again. That was sort of done at that point because the Henry count had been done and all of that. But we cited back to that to say, you know, this is an example of what people are telling you and what's being filed in some of these court filings that are just not supported by the evidence. And this is the problem. The problem is people keep telling you these things and they turn out not to be true. In addition, there is the highly troubling matter of Dominion voting systems. In one Michigan county alone, 6,000 votes were switched from Trump to Biden. And the same systems are used in the majority of states in our country. I went into this and would, you know, tell them how crazy some of these allegations were and how ridiculous some of them were. Uh, and I'm talking about some of the ones like, you know, more votes, more absentee votes were cast in Pennsylvania than there were absentee ballots requests. You know, stuff like that it was just easy to blow up. There was never... There was never an indication of interest in what the actual facts were. There were more votes than there were voters. Think of that. You had more votes than you had voters. That's an easy one to figure. And spy the thousands. Then he raised the, the, the big vote dump, uh, as he called it, in Detroit. And that, you know, he said people saw boxes coming into the counting station at all hours of the morning. And I said, Mr. President, there are 630 precincts in Detroit. And unlike elsewhere in the state, they centralize the counting process. So they're not counted in each precinct. They're moved to counting stations. And so the normal process would involve boxes coming in at all different hours. This is Michigan. At 6.31 in the morning, a vote dump of 149,772 votes came in unexpectedly. With regard to Georgia, we looked at the tape, we interviewed the witnesses. There is no suitcase. The president kept fixating on this suitcase that supposedly had fraudulent ballots and that the suitcase was rolled out from under the table. And I said... No, sir, there is no suitcase. You can watch that video over and over. There is no suitcase. There is a wheeled bin where they carry the ballots, and that's just how they move ballots around that facility. There's nothing suspicious about that at all. Election officials pull boxes, Democrats, and suitcases of ballots out from under a table. You all saw it on television. Totally fraudulent. This happened over and over again. And our committee's report will document it. Purposeful lies made in public directly at odds with what Donald Trump knew from unassailable sources, the Justice Department's own investigations, and his own campaign. Donald Trump maliciously repeated this nonsense to a wide audience over and over again. His intent was to deceive. President Trump's plan also involved trying to coerce government officials to change the election outcome in the states he lost. He personally reached out to numerous state officials and pressured them to take unlawful steps to alter the election results in those states. These actions, taken directly by the president himself, made it clear what his intentions were to prevent the orderly transfer of power. We all recall, for example, President Trump's tape-recorded call with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. At the time this call occurred, President Trump had already been told repeatedly by the U.S. Justice Department, by his campaign, 
and by his advisors that his allegations of fraud in Georgia were false. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Look, we need only 11,000 votes. We have far more than that as it stands now. We'll have more and more. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. I just want to find 11,780 votes. That's an extraordinary demand by the president, especially since he already knew from the Justice Department there was no genuine basis for this request. No one could think it would be legal for the Secretary of State to simply find the votes the president needed in order to win. Secretary Raffensperger told the president the truth, that he lost the election in Georgia. But President Trump did not accept that answer. Instead, he suggested that Secretary Raffensperger himself might be prosecuted. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. We know that President Trump's White House advisors reacted negatively. Immediately after the call, Cassidy Hutchinson had a conversation with Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. I remember looking at Mark and I said, Mark, you can't possibly think we're going to pull this off. Like, that call was crazy. And he looked at me and just started shaking his head and he was like, no, Cass, you know, he knows it's over. He knows he lost, but we're going to keep trying. There's some good options out there still. We're going to keep trying. This call and other related activity is now the focus of an ongoing criminal investigation in Fulton County, Georgia. And Georgia is not the only state where President Trump tried to pressure state officials to change the results. He also attempted to pressure state officials in Arizona, Pennsylvania, and Michigan to change the results in those states as well. While President Trump was pressuring state officials, he was also trying to use the Department of Justice to change the election result. His top officials told him that there was no evidence to support his claims of fraud, but he didn't care. As he told them, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. When these officials would not do what he said, President Trump embarked in an effort to install Jeff Clark as acting attorney general, solely because he, he would do what others in the department would not do. We know that Trump was doing so for a specific purpose, so Clark could corruptly employ the Justice Department's authority to help persuade the states to flip electoral votes. For example, when Richard Donahue and Jeff Rosen, both appointed by President Trump, learned of Mr. Clark's proposal, here's why they said they forcefully rejected it. And I recall toward the end saying, what you're proposing is nothing less than the United States Justice Department meddling in the outcome of a presidential election. Uh, but more importantly, this was not based on fact. This was actually contrary to the facts as developed by department investigations over the last several weeks and months. Um, so I responded to that, and for the department to insert itself into the political process this way, I think would have had grave consequences for the country. It may very well have spiraled us into a constitutional crisis. We know from our investigation that President Trump offered Jeff Clark the position of acting attorney general, and that Jeff Clark had decided to accept it. The only reason this ultimately did not happen is that the White House counsel and a number of Justice Department officials confronted the president in the Oval Office and threatened mass resignations. And then, um, and I said something to the effect of, you're gonna have a huge personnel blowout within hours because you're going to have all kinds of problems with resignations and other issues. And that's not going to be in anyone's interest. The president ultimately relented only because the entire leadership of the Department of Justice, as well as his White House counsel, threatened to resign. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The young woman yields back.
the chair recognizes the young woman from Florida, Mrs. Murphy, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Trump's efforts to unlawfully overturn the results of the 2020 election were not limited to the big lie in pressuring state officials and the Department of Justice officials. Another key part of the president's effort was a scheme to assemble fake electors to cast false electoral votes in the states that President Trump lost. This was something done not only with the pre president's knowledge, but also with his direct participation. Rana McDaniel, chair of the Republican National Committee, testified before this committee that President Trump and his attorney, Dr. John Eastman, called her and asked her to arrange for the fake electors to meet and rehearse the process of casting their fake votes. When I received the call, um, again, I don't remember the exact date, um, it was it was from the White House switchboard, um, and, and it was President Trump who had, had contacted me. And did President Trump have anyone else on the line with him? Um, he introduced me to a, a gentleman named uh, John Eastman. So I vaguely remember him mentioning that he was a professor, and then essentially he turned the call over to Mr. Eastman, who then proceeded to talk about the importance of the RNC helping the campaign gather these contingent electors in case any of the legal challenges um, that were ongoing changed the result of any of the dates. These fake electors were ultimately part of the president's plan to replace genuine Biden electors with Trump electors on January 6th. As part of this plan, the false electoral slates were sent to the National Archives and to the Capitol. The fake electors plan was also tied to another plan, the coercive pressure campaign to make Vice President Mike Pence reject or refuse to count certain Biden electoral votes so that President Donald Trump would, quote, win re-election instead. Here is what Vice President Pence has said about this scheme. President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. And frankly, there is no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. Make no mistake, President Trump knew that what he was demanding Vice President Pence do was illegal. He was informed of this repeatedly and specifically on January 4th. Even his lawyer, John Eastman, admitted in front of President Trump that this plan would break the law by violating the Electoral Count Act. Did John Eastman ever admit, as far as you know, in front of the president that his proposal would violate the Electoral Count Act? Uh, I believe he did on the 4th. And Dr. Eastman confirmed this in writing. Recall this email written on January 6, in which Vice President Pence's counsel asked Dr. Eastman, did you advise the president that in your professional judgment, the vice president does not have power to decide things unilaterally? Dr. Eastman replied, he's been so advised. Of course, President Trump's own White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, also recognized that this plan was unlawful. Here is Mr. Cipollone's testimony. My view is that the vice president had, didn't have the legal authority to do anything except what he did. There is no doubt that President Trump's pressure campaign on Vice President Pence was significant. On the morning of January 6, President Trump called the vice president from the Oval Office and demanded that he overturn the results of the election. Numerous witnesses told uh, the select committee about the invective that President Trump leveled at his own vice president. Something to the effect, this is, the wording's wrong. I made the wrong decision four or five years ago. And the, the word that she relayed to that the president called the vice president, I apologize for being impolite, but do you rem remember what she said her father called him? The P word. 
But Vice President Pence didn't waver even when his own life was endangered by President Trump and the rioters at the Capitol on January 6th, as you'll see in more detail later. A federal judge concluded, based on this and other evidence, that President Trump's pressure campaign against the vice president likely violated multiple criminal statutes. In the end, all these people, Department of Justice officials, state elections officials, his own vice president, stood strong in the face of President Trump's immense pressure. But as we now know, President Trump had already summoned tens of thousands of his supporters to Washington on January 6th to take back their country. On December 19th, President Trump first told his supporters to come to Washington. In this and numerous other tweets, he fraudulently and repeatedly promoted January 6th as the day Americans could come and change the election outcome. For weeks, President Trump worked with others to plan the rally, intending all along that he would send an assembled crowd of angry supporters to the Capitol after his speech on the Ellipse on January 6th. We obtained a text message that one rally organizer sent on January 4th. In part, it reads that, quote, POTUS is going to have us march there, slash the Capitol, and POTUS is going to just call for it unexpectedly. Again, each of these examples, the big lie, the pressure campaigns against state officials, the pressure campaign against the Department of Justice and his vice president, the fake electors, summoning the mob, all of this demonstrates President Trump's personal and substantial role in the plot to overturn the election. He was intimately involved. He was the central player. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. General Woman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In our past hearings, you have seen direct evidence that President Trump sent a crowd of his supporters to the Capitol on January 6th, knowing they were armed and angry. This was the last, most desperate and dangerous prong of his plan to disrupt the joint session and prevent the orderly transition of power. On the morning of the 6th, the Secret Service was at the Ellipse, screening the members of the crowd as they entered the rally site. And they noticed something significant about the crowd. Tens of thousands of people were outside the rally site, but did not want to go through the magnetometers the metal detectors that were used to screen for dangerous weapons. Since our last hearings, the Select Committee has received greater cooperation from the Secret Service. Nevertheless, Secret Service text messages from this period were erased in the days and months following the attack on the Capitol, even though documents and materials related to January 6th had already been requested by the Department of Justice and Congress. But we were able to obtain nearly one million emails, recordings, and other electronic records from the Secret Service. Over the month of August, the Select Committee began its review of hundreds of thousands of pages and multiple hours of that material, providing substantial new evidence about what happened on January 6th and the days leading up to it. That review continues. What you're about to hear is just a sample of the new and relevant evidence that we have received. Mounting evidence before January 6th predicted violence, and not just violence generally, but violence directed at the Capitol. Intelligence about this risk was directly available to the U.S. Secret Service and others in the White House in advance of the Ellipse speech, in advance of the march to the Capitol. The committee has shown evidence that President Trump was aware of the risk of violence. The FBI, U.S. Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police, and other agencies all gathered and disseminated intelligence suggesting the possibility of violence at the Capitol prior to the riot. We're now going to show you just a sample of the evidence we have received. Days before January 6th, the President's senior advisors at the Department of Justice and FBI, for example, received an intelligence summary that included material indicating that certain people traveling to Washington were making plans to attack the Capitol. This summary noted online calls to occupy federal buildings, rhetoric about invading the Capitol building, 
and plans to arm themselves and to engage in political violence at the event. Other agencies were also hearing predictions suggesting possible violence at the Capitol. On a call with President Trump's White House National Security Staff in early January 2021, Deputy Secretary of Defense David Norquist had warned about the potential that the Capitol would be the target of the attack. Here's General Mark Milley, who was also present for this call, describing Deputy Secretary Norquist's warning. So during these calls, I only remember it in hindsight because he was almost like clairvoyant. Um, Norquist says during one of these calls, the greatest threat is a direct assault on the Capitol. I'll never forget it. This email, for example, was an alert that the Secret Service received on December 24th with the heading, Armed and Ready, Mr. President. According to the intelligence, multiple users online were targeting members of Congress, instructing others to march into the chambers on January 6th and make sure they know who to fear. In this report received on December 26th, a Secret Service field office relayed a tip that had been received by the FBI. According to the source of the tip, the Proud Boys plan to march armed into D.C. They think that they will have a large enough group to march into D.C. armed, the source reported, and will outnumber the police so they can't be stopped. The source went on to say their plan is to literally kill people. Please, please take this tip seriously and investigate further. The source also made clear that the Proud Boys had detailed their plans on multiple websites like the Donald.win. Let's pause here. The Secret Service had advanced information more than 10 days beforehand regarding the Proud Boys planning for January 6th. We know now, of course, that the Proud Boys and others did lead the assault on our Capitol building. On December 31st, agents circulated intelligence reports that President Trump supporters have proposed a movement to occupy Capitol Hill. In particular, they flagged spikes in violent hashtags like, we are the storm, 1776 rebel, and occupy capitals. On January 5th, a Secret Service open source unit flagged a social media account on the Donald.win that threatened to bring a sniper rifle to a rally on January 6th. The user also posted a picture of a handgun and rifle with the caption, Sunday Gun Day, providing Overwatch January 6th will be wild. Later, on the evening of January 5th, the Secret Service learned during an FBI briefing that right-wing groups were establishing armed QRFs, or Quick Reaction Forces, readying to deploy for January 6th. Groups like the Oath Keepers were standing by at the ready should POTUS request assistance. By invoking the Insurrection Act, agents were informed. As we all know now, the Oath Keepers did play a specific role on January 6th and had stashed weapons in Virginia for further violence that evening. Also on that day, the Secret Service was raiding its security precautions for the President's speech at the Ellipse the next day. A Secret Service deputy chief instructed agents to add certain objects to the list of items that would be prohibited at the rally site, including ballistic vests, tactical vests, armored or not, and ballistic helmets. By the morning of January 6th, it was clear that the Secret Service anticipated violence. It felt like the calm before the storm, one agent predicted in a Protective Intelligence Division chat group. Another remarked how agents were watching the crazies on live stream. By 9.09 that morning, the Secret Service could also see that many rally goers were assembled outside the security perimeter. One agent emailed, possibly because they have stuff that couldn't come through, would probably be an issue with this crowd, just a thought. By 9.30 that morning, Agents reported more than 25,000 people outside the rally site. An hour later, the Secret Service reported that the crowd was on the mall watching, but not in line. 
The head of the President's Secret Service protective detail, Robert Engel, was specifically aware of the large crowds outside the magnetometers. He passed that information along to Tony Ornato, who worked for Mark Meadows in the Chief of Staff's office. The documents we obtained from the Secret Service make clear that the crowd outside the magnetometers was armed and the agents knew it. Take a look at what they were seeing and hearing on the ground. One report from the rally site at 7.58 a.m. said, some members of the crowd are wearing ballistic helmets, body armor, carrying radio equipment and military grade backpacks. Another from 9.30 a.m said that there were possibly OC spray, meaning pepper spray, and or plastic riot shields. At 11.23 a.m., agents also reported possible armed individuals, one with a Glock, one with a rifle. Over the next hour, agents reported possible man with a gun reported, confirmed pistol on hip located in a tree, and one detained at 14th and I Street Northwest individual had an assault rifle on his person. Minutes before President Trump began his speech, members of the Federal Protective Service, an agency tasked with protecting federal buildings, were alerted about an arrest of a protester with a gun on his waistband. And during the speech, the weapons-related arrests continued. At 12.13 p.m., United States Park Police arrested a man with a rifle in front of the World War II Memorial. These agents remarked on the number of weapons that had been seized that day, speculating that the situation could get worse. With so many weapons found so far, you wonder how many are unknown, one agent wrote at 12.36 p.m. Could be sporty after dark. At 12.47 p.m., another agent responded, no doubt. The people at the Ellipse said they are moving to the Capitol after the POTUS speech. As the documents we received make clear, the Secret Service was aware of weapons possessed by those gathered at rallies in DC as early as the evening before. Take this document, for instance, which details multiple arrests in the crowds demonstrating on January 5th. Those arrests were for weapons offenses, handguns, high-capacity feeding devices, ammunition. What the Secret Service saw on the 6th was entirely consistent with the violent rhetoric circulating in the days before the joint session on pro-Trump websites, at times amplified by the President's own advisors. On one of these sites, as you've heard, one of those was called the Donald.Win. The Select Committee has obtained a text message that Jason Miller a senior communications advisor sent to Mark Meadows less than a week before January 6th. I got the base fired up, he wrote in all caps. He sent a link to this page on the Donald.win. The linked web page had comments about the joint session of Congress on January 6th. Take a look at some of those comments. Gallows don't require electricity. If the filthy commie maggots try to push their fraud through, there will be hell to pay. Our lawmakers in Congress can leave one of two ways. One, in a body bag. Two, after rightfully certifying Trump the winner. Mr. Miller claimed that he had no idea about the hundreds of comments like these in the link that he sent to Mark Meadows. If I had seen something like that, I probably would have flipped it to someone at the White or if I had seen some of that nature, I would have said we got to flag this for secret service or something of that nature. But the Trump administration was aware of this type of violent record rhetoric prior to January 6th. In fact, as we have seen, the Secret Service and other agencies knew of the prospect of violence well in advance of the president's speech at the Ellipse. Despite this, Certain White House and Secret Service witnesses previously testified that they had received no intelligence about violence that could have potentially threatened any of the protectees on January 6th, including the Vice President. Evidence strongly suggests that this testimony is not credible. 
and the committee is reviewing additional material from the Secret Service and other sources. The Secret Service was monitoring this kind of online activity and was sharing and receiving the results of that effort. They work closely with other agencies, sharing intelligence about the joint session of Congress derived from social media and other sources. The same day Jason Miller sent his text message, agents received reports about a spike in activity on another platform called Parler. This was December 30th. In this email, an agent received a report noting a lot of violent rhetoric on Parler directed at government people and entities, including Secret Service protectees. One of these protectees was Vice President Pence, perhaps the primary target of President Trump's pressure campaign in the days leading up to January 6th. The day before the joint session, on January 5th, Secret Service was aware of increased chatter focused on Vice President Pence, in particular, whether he would do what President Trump wanted him to do, reverse the results of the election in the joint session the next day, January 6th. On the morning of the 6th, agents received alerts of online threats that Vice President Pence would be, quote, a dead man walking if he doesn't do the right thing. Another agent reported, quote, I saw several other alerts saying they will storm the Capitol if he doesn't do the right thing. The anger reflected in these postings was obvious to the man at the center of the storm on January 6th, President Trump. On the evening of January 5th, President Trump gathered a few of his communications staffers in the Oval Office. The door was open, allowing the President and others assembled there to hear the sounds of the crowd gathered at Freedom Plaza just a few blocks from the White House. President Trump could tell that his supporters were riled up. Here again is Judd Deere, a Deputy White House uh, press secretary, describing the President's reaction. He fairly quickly moved to uh, how fired up the crowd is or was going to be. And what did he say about it? Um, just that they were they were fired up, they were angry, they feel like the election has been stolen, that the election was rigged, that um, he went on and on about that for a little bit. Yes, the president knew the crowd was angry because he had stoked that anger. He knew that they believed that the election had been rigged and stolen because he had told them falsely that it had been rigged and stolen. And by the time he incited that angry mob to march on the Capitol, he knew they were armed and dangerous. All the better to stop the peaceful transfer of power. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. At this point in our meeting, we'll take a brief recess. Pursuant to the order of the committee of today, the chair declares the committee in recess for a period of approximately 10 minutes. A brief break in today's hearing looking at former President Trump's state of mind. Vice Chair Liz Cheney saying the central cause of January 6th was one man, Donald Trump. The committee is asserting that President Trump knew he lost the 2020 presidential election and yet kept up a charade publicly claiming he had won. This is a special report from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey and I'm joined by James Holman. James, we're hearing from committee members one by one, each taking part of this equation, what Donald Trump knew, when he knew it, and then how he acted regardless of what he knew. Absolutely. The effort here, Libby, has been clear. They want to make Donald Trump central to this story, uh, that this was not people being rogue, that this was not spontaneous, that even before January 6th, whether it was Roger Stone on the documentarian tape or Amy Kremer texting Mike Lindell, uh, that Trump planned to encourage people to march on the Capitol uh, even before the rally. And as we just saw there, uh, knew that the crowd was fired up, knew 
uh, that people had weapons in the crowd when he told them to march on the Capitol. Yeah, you just pivoted to an important point, James, because there's the question of President Trump wanting to go to the Capitol, which we have a lot of evidence showing that he wanted to go, he demanded to go to the Capitol. But then you made an important pivot, this question of who he knew he was sending to the Capitol, the fact that they were armed, the fact that they were riled up, because otherwise a supporter of President Trump could say, look, he wanted to go to the Capitol and have his voice heard there. Right, and this is, uh, this is key to intent and key to state of mind, which is a a term, you know, you get into, when you start talking about a potential legal case, uh, obviously this is a, more of a political indictment than a legal indictment, but, uh, you know, mens rea, which is intent. Uh, and so you hear the, the replay of the Washington Post's uh, reporting. We uh, obtained the audio of Trump's call with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, where he's saying, come on, fellas, I just need 11,000 votes. It, it gets into his state of mind. You see the tape where uh, senior officials in his campaign, at the Justice Department and in the White House uh, are saying these conspiracy theories are bunk. And then the committee was playing us tape, uh, you know, saying one day later, six days later, four days later, where Trump was repeating something that he had been told by his own team wasn't true. And he was saying it anyway. So this all gets into state of mind. It gets into the idea that Trump was knowingly, uh, not just should have known, but knew that what he was saying was false and was saying it anyway to rile up these people that then we know he knew were armed and dangerous. We just saw a moment there, James, some of the officers who defended the Capitol that day, Caroline Edwards, the first to be injured, Daniel Hodges, who we saw terrible footage of him being crushed uh, by these attackers of the Capitol. Uh, let's bring Rhonda Colvin into the conversation. She has been in that hearing room where those police officers are listening to this testimony. Rhonda, what is it like to be, to be in that chamber today? Well, it's well attended. In fact, it's pretty loud, and I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but I, I believe you asked about what, uh, how it feels to be here today. Um, I look back at the public seating where the audience is, and it, it always stuns me when I'm in these hearing rooms that everyone is incredibly attentive. There are members of Congress who are also sitting in the crowd today. And that's interesting because the House is out right now. They're out until uh, November, after the November election. Uh, so for them to come here and, and want to be a part of this and sit in the, the audience has been interesting. And you also mentioned those officers. And I, I want to make a point about that, that they have been in attendance uh, in the early days of this panel, in the the uh, hearings, the, the business meetings, rather, that this committee had earlier in the year that were a little bit dry, and they, they were going over uh, contempt charges of some of the folks who would not comply with their subpoenas. Uh, but the police officers were here, and I've spoken with them uh, at the beginning of this public phase of hearings and meetings, uh, going over the details the committee has found. And the officers have told me that they, they want answers, that they have been waiting for answers, and that they put their bodies on the line that day, and that they expect these members of Congress to, to do something and to find out what they can. Um, but yes, they are, they're here in attendance, uh, and, and it's, again, a room where everybody is following. And, and that's also interesting as well, because most of us who have been following this committee's work a lot of this uh, stuff they're going over today is basically a review, and we heard that from the chairman as well. What he said in the beginning, that many people might be familiar with what they are talking about today, but they are sort of putting together all of the details, stringing them together to show that Trump was at the center of uh, the plans that led to the six. And I think one of the interesting points, too, uh, that came out was we saw that uh, clip of a, a film uh, that Dutch filmmakers made on Roger Stone. And it, it showed how back in November, before Election Day even occurred, that Stone was saying that you basically just take elections. And then if you if that doesn't work, you, you know, violence will occur. That shows you that in these circles close to Trump, there was already talk of taking the election, regardless of the outcome. So you're seeing just almost premeditation uh, of the plans that led to uh, the attack on the Capitol. James, we heard early on in this hearing today news that the committee would be able to essentially take a vote today, that this is, in essence, a business meeting. The Washington Post is reporting uh, that the committee is planning to vote to subpoena former President Donald Trump. That's right, Libby. Three sources familiar tell us that uh, they will vote at the end of today's hearing to subpoena the former president for testimony. 
This is likely futile, uh, but it is also the most aggressive step that the committee has taken. Uh, Trump will almost certainly not comply with this subpoena. Uh, and if Republicans, as expected, take control of Congress in January, they can uh, try to quash it. This would lead to a legal fight. But it does sort of put the onus on Trump to come and testify under oath uh, about what he knew and what his aims were on the 6th. Rhonda, you've covered so many of those business meetings that you were just describing a moment ago. So talk to us about how uh, these votes take place and how the committee moves forward. Well, and I just want to point out, too, so this is a committee, a select committee, and it does have subpoena power. And we've seen them issue many subpoenas uh, over the last year. What's interesting, if they are going to take this vote, that's something that we, we haven't yet seen them do, uh, they're able to issue subpoenas. So. Um, for them to put this on the table publicly, do this vote, that's interesting. Here's another interesting thing. If Trump does not comply with the subpoena, this committee might face another vote where they would refer contempt charges to the DOJ, just like they did with Mark Meadows, Steve Bannon, and they would, that would go to a full House vote. So you might see right now that time is of the essence, because if Trump does not comply with that subpoena, and this committee wants to hold him in contempt, they've got to do it while they have a Democratic majority, because that contempt charge will have to go to a full House vote, and it's unlikely that Republicans uh, would, would vote for those contempt charges to be sent over to the DOJ for further prosecutorial action. So that's, that's what I'm watching to see what, what this next step really is, what it looks like, and, and how fast we're going to be moving. Such a great point, Rhonda, on the on the timeline. James, what does this open the door to? I mean, if they do uh, vote to subpoena President Trump and then they do move forward on that process, what does this open the door for, both in terms of what the committee could gather, the actions they could take, but also what future committees might do? Absolutely. It is potentially precedent-setting. I, 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 I believe it's unprecedented uh, to actually have a formal subpoena of a former president. Uh, you have had presidents come and voluntarily testify. Gerald Ford, for example, came to talk about his decision to pardon Richard Nixon. Uh, but, but to have a subpoena is a, kind of a, a separation of powers question. It would potentially go to the courts. This is the kind of thing that uh, could play out for years. But it's also, it, you, let's just think about it as the committee calling Donald Trump's bluff. Uh, at some point, Trump said he would love to come and talk to the committee. Uh, and this is them saying, OK, come, come talk. Uh, and Trump's not going to want to do that. Uh, but this is giving him the opportunity and, and putting the onus on him. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, we're, you're not going to see footage of Trump pleading the fifth over and over again, as he did in a recent deposition with the New York Attorney General's office related to the criminal investigation of real estate fraud at the Trump Organization. Well, the committee will resume here in just a few moments. But in the meantime, I want to play some footage from earlier today. This is committee member Adam Kinzinger, Republican, of course. He made this straightforward summation of former President Trump's state of mind in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election. Let's listen. President Trump knew the truth. He heard what all his experts and senior staff were telling him. He knew he had lost the election. But he made the deliberate choice to ignore the courts, to ignore the Justice Department, to ignore his campaign leadership, to ignore senior advisors, and to pursue a completely unlawful effort to overturn the election. His intent was plain. Ignore the rule of law and stay in power. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin for what the committee members are asserting about President Trump. Well, they're just establishing that he was aware he lost, but yet continued to move forward with election denial and with uh, ramping up these, these calls for action from his side. So despite knowing the facts, he went ahead. And that's what Kinzinger was using in that example, showing that Trump was well aware he had lost. And that's something that the committee started out with when they started this public phase of hearings. They wanted to establish that Trump was aware this wasn't someone who just hadn't been told that he didn't win the election. He was fully aware, but went in an, in an orchestrated fashion uh, to try to undermine the election. 
All right, thanks, Rhonda. You know, James, this question of getting into Trump's state of mind is tricky because we're not hearing from him directly. Of course, we expect the committee to subpoena him uh, and ask him to come before them. But talk to us about how they're building a case and gathering witnesses and gathering information from others who were aware of what he was thinking or aware at least of what he was saying to them. That's that's key, Libby. Uh, one of the, I think, some of the freshest developments, some of the newest material we've seen today really gets at the idea that this was premeditated. Uh, and, and to your question, we saw those emails from Tom Fitton at Judicial Watch saying he had spoken with Donald Trump and Trump had reviewed the draft of a statement declaring victory on election night, even if he was losing. Uh, the, the Having people saying, I heard this from the president, I talked to the president, the president told me this, does put Trump directly there. And it being uh, premeditated that before the election, before January 6th, this wasn't spontaneous. We saw that text from Amy Kremer, who was a Tea Party activist who organized the Stop the Steal rally to Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, saying that she uh, had been told that Trump was going to call on people spontaneously during his rally to go to the Capitol, which is what, in fact, Trump did. Uh, that really does illustrate that this was planned. This was not a spur of the moment thing. And, and that does get into state of mind, it gets into intent. Uh, and and it is ultimately pretty damning evidence. So, James, what are you going to be listening for here as the committee resumes its work? The, that that period from January sixth to January twentieth, during the summer, since we last saw the committee meet in July, they've had multiple cabinet members come and testify. We saw a brief clip of former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, I assume we're going to see some footage of cabinet secretaries like Elaine Chao, who's married to uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who, who resigned after January 6th, talking about why she stepped down. It's that period from January 6th through the inauguration, uh, kind of the, the effort by the government to land the plane, as Mark Milley uh, had testified. Uh, we haven't really gotten to any of that yet. I expect we'll see a lot of that in the back half. Another word of warning we've gotten from committee members here is that this is not something in the past, right, James, that they're saying they need to do this work to prevent uh, a, a takeover of the government from happening in the future, a subversion of democracy and the rule of law. Yeah, Liz Cheney uh, said it pretty clearly that this is an ongoing threat and that that's why it's vital that the committee do this work. Uh, that next time we won't necessarily be able to rely on the men and women who helped uh, the rule of law and institutions uh, hold the day, uh, that those same people might not be around next time because if Donald Trump is president in 2025 or 2028, uh, he wouldn't have people uh, like the folks who've come forward and testified as witnesses there to, to check him. So we've heard from a variety of committee members so far, James. More yet to come. Each of them are taking a facet of, uh, of the timeline as well as the, the state of mind of Donald Trump. Yeah, um, and they've done a good job, Libby, of trying to, you know, it, it is a summation. There is obviously uh, repeating some of the larger arguments that we heard during the previous uh, hearings, but they're, they're peppering in new evidence, new uh, testimony, new video. We saw fresh video of Cassidy Hutchinson that we hadn't seen before uh, in which she recalled this kind of cinematic uh, showdown on the White House uh, colonnade outside the Rose Garden uh, where Trump was incensed that the Supreme Court had ruled against him and was yelling at Mark Meadows, we can't let people know that we lost. Why didn't you make more calls? Why didn't you do more? That's a scene we hadn't ever heard before. So they, they are telling the story again in the summation, but it's not just a rehash of what we've already seen. Some information presented by Adam Kinzinger tried to accomplish two things. One, it showed that Trump knew he was not long for office, that he was leaving office soon. And what I'm talking about uh, is these orders that President Trump was signing to pull troops out uh, of places like Somalia and Afghanistan. And what this is getting at, James, is that the president's realizing his time is limited, but also it's getting at something that's very important to Adam Kinzinger. The, 
the U.S. shouldn't have pulled out of Afghanistan and Somalia. Uh, you think about how different all of this might have played out if uh, if Trump actually had just pulled out of Afghanistan before he left office. You wouldn't have had the meltdown in August of 2021. It would have happened in December of 2020. And Kinzinger is trying to, to convey that the same mistakes would have happened on Trump's watch as happened under Biden's. The committee members coming back in, taking their seat. Of course, the committee chair there, Benny Thompson, with his gavel. Let's go back now to Cannon House Office Building and this select committee investigating January 6th and the attempts to overturn the 2020 election. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the morning of January 6th, President Trump knew that the crowd was angry. He knew that they were armed and dangerous, and he knew that they were going to the Capitol. It's important to understand the lengths the president was willing to go to physically be at the Capitol because it was part of his strategy to disrupt Congress and to stay in power. As the time for the Ellipse rally approached, an email was circulated among intelligence officials, including Secret Service intelligence official, attaching communications among rally goers that specifically contemplated violence. Trump has given us marching orders. One post on the Donald.Win wrote, basically, if you're east of the Mississippi, you can and should be there. Advance on the Capitol. Keep your guns hidden. Don't fuck around. Full kits, 180 rounds minimum for main rifle, another 50 for sidearm per person. What is clear from this record is that the White House had more than enough warning to warrant stopping any plan for an ellipse rally and certainly for stopping any march to the Capitol. And as evidence from our prior hearings has suggested, the President was aware of this information. But despite awareness of the potential for violence and weapons among the crowd, the ellipse event nevertheless went forward and Donald Trump instructed the angry crowd some of whom were armed, to march to the Capitol. As my colleague Mr. Schiff just described, the Secret Service reported that thousands in the crowd near the Washington Monument would not enter the rally area because magnetometers used in screening attendees would detect any prohibited items they carried. Mr. Trump knew this. His Secret Service had told him about it that morning. Even in spite of these warnings, Cassidy Hutchinson overheard the president say this shortly before he took stage. He wanted it full and he was angry that we weren't letting people through the mags with weapons, what the Secret Service deemed as weapons and our, our weapons. I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me, take the effing mags away let my people in, they can march to the Capitol from here, let the people in, take the effing mags away. And when he went on stage, President Trump himself asked law enforcement to let his supporters in the rally site. And I'd love to have if those tens of thousands of people would be allowed, the military, the Secret Service, and we want to thank you, and the police law enforcement, great, you're doing a great job. But I'd love it if they could be allowed to come up here with us. Is that possible? Can you just let them come up, please? President Trump then told his supporters to march to the Capitol. Let's pause at this point to consider President Trump's state of mind, his motivation at this moment. By that point, it was known to Secret Service that members of the crowd were armed. President Trump had been told, and there was no doubt that President Trump knew what he was going to do, sending an angry mob, a number of whom were clad in tactical gear and military garb, armed with various weapons, to the Capitol. There's no scenario where that action is benign. And there's no scenario where an American president should have engaged in that conduct. It did not matter whether President Trump believed the election had been stolen or not. This could not be justified on any basis for any reason. You may also recall testimony from our summer hearings regarding Mr. Trump's efforts to lead the mob to the Capitol himself in his angry altercation in the presidential SUV when the Secret Service told him 
it was far too dangerous for him to go. As we detailed in testimony from the Metropolitan Police and White House personnel during our July 21st hearing, information about the altercation was widely known. So widely known that one former White House employee with national security responsibilities explained that this information was in fact water cooler talk in the White House complex. As that professional told us, they remember hearing in the days after January 6th how angry the president was when he was in a limo that afternoon. That professional also testified that they were specifically informed of the president's irate behavior in the SUV by Mr. Ornato in Mr. Ornato's office. It was Mr. Engel with Mr. Ornato in that office. They'd expressed to me that the president was irate, you know, on the drive up. Mr. Engel did not deny the fact that the president was irate. That, of course, corresponds closely with the testimony you saw this summer from Cassidy Hutchinson, a Metropolitan Police officer who was in the motorcade and from multiple sources. Additionally, after concluding its review of the voluminous additional Secret Service communications from January 5th and January 6th, the committee will be recalling witnesses and conducting further investigative depositions based on that material. Following that activity, we will provide even greater detail in our final report. And I will also note this. The committee is reviewing testimony regarding potential obstruction on this issue, including testimony about advice given not to tell the committee about this specific topic. We will address this matter in our report. We also want to remind you now of how security professionals working in the White House complex and who reported to national security officials responded when they learned that Mr. Trump intended to lead the mob to the Capitol. To be completely honest, uh, we were all in a state of shock. Because why? Because, because it just, one, I think the actual physical feasibility of doing it, and then also we all knew what that indicated and what that meant, that this was no longer a rally, that this was going to move to something else if he physically walked to the Capitol. I, I don't know if you want to use the word insurrection, coup, whatever. We all knew that this would move from a normal uh, democratic, you know, public event into something else. Why were we alarmed? Right. Uh, the president wanted to lead tens of thousands of people to the Capitol. Um, I think that was enough grounds for us to be alarmed. President Trump was still considering traveling to the Capitol even after returning to the White House. He knew well before 2 p.m. that a violent riot was underway at the Capitol. He was aware of the ongoing lawlessness, but his motorcade was held on West Executive Avenue outside the White House because he still wanted to join the crowd. Here's Kaylee McEnany, the White House press secretary, describing an exchange she had with the president as soon as he arrived back at the White House. So to the best of my recollection, I recall him being um, wanting to, saying that he wanted to physically walk and be a part of the march and then saying that uh, he would ride the beast um, if, if he needed to, right in the presidential limo. From the Secret Service, the Select Committee has also obtained important new evidence on this issue. It shows how frantic this hour must have been for the Secret Service, scrambling to get the President of the United States to back down from a dangerous and reckless decision that put people in harm's way. Take a look at the Secret Service email from 1.19 p.m. on January 6th, the minute that President Trump got out of the presidential vehicle back at the White House. As soon as the president left his motorcade, leadership from the Secret Service contacted Bobby Engel, the lead agent for the presidential detail, and warned him that they were, quote, concerned about an OTR, an off-the-record movement, to the Capitol. The people sworn to protect the safety of the president of the United States and who routinely put themselves in harm's way were convinced that this was a bad idea. Secret Service documents also reveal how agents were poised to take President Trump to the Capitol later that afternoon. Agents were instructed to don their protective gear and prepare for a movement. A few minutes later, they were told,
the president would leave for the Capitol in two hours. It wasn't until 1.55 p.m. that the president's lead Secret Service agent told them to stand down. We are not doing an OTR to the Capitol. By then, rioters had breached the Capitol and were violently attacking the efforts of the brave men and women in law enforcement trying to resist the mob. President Trump may not have gone to the Capitol on January 6th, but what he did from the White House cannot be justified. While congressional leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, worked with Vice President Pence to try and address the violence, President Trump refused urgent pleas for help from nearly everyone around him. And what he did do only made the situation worse. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The president was still exhorting his supporters at the Ellipse to go fight like hell at 1250, around the time that the first wave of rioters first breached barricades defending the Capitol. Secret Service documents we recently received give a timeline of precisely what the White House knew and when. At 119, the President's Emergency Operations Center sent an email to Secret Service, National Security, and Military Advisors to the President and Vice President, informing them that, quote, hundreds of Trump supporters stormed through metal barricades at the back of the Capitol building about 1 p.m. Wednesday, running past security guards and breaking fences. When the President returned to the White House around 1.20, he entered the Oval Office and was told right then about the onset of violence at the Capitol. From that point until approximately 4 p.m., over the next two hours and 40 minutes, the President stayed in the White House dining room, attached to the Oval Office, and watched this unprecedented assault take place at the Capitol. We have testimony from several members of the President's White House staff establishing that President Trump refused entreaties from his closest advisors and family members to tell his supporters to stand down and leave the Capitol. Here's the testimony of President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. I can't talk about conversations with the president, but I can generically say that I said, you know, people need to be told there needs to be a public announcement fast that they need to leave the Capitol. And Pat, could you let us know approximately when you said that? Approximately when? Almost immediately after I found out people were getting into the Capitol or approaching the Capitol in a way that was, was uh, violent. You, on the staff, did not want people to leave the Capitol. On the staff? I, in I, the White House. I, 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 don't, I, I can't think of anybody. <laughs> You know, on that day, we didn't want people to get out of the the Capitol once the, you know, particularly once the violence started. No, I mean, it, what about the president? Yeah. Well, she said the staff. So I answered. No, I said in the White House. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I thought you said who, who else on the staff. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't reveal communications, but obviously, I think you know. Mr. Cipollone's testimony is corroborated by multiple other White House staff members, including Cassidy Hutchinson. Here's Ms. Hutchinson describing what she heard from Mark Meadows. He uh, had said something to the effect of, you know, you heard him, Pat. He doesn't want to do anything more. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. A former White House employee with national security duties similarly recalled an exchange between Mr. Cipollone and Eric Hirschman about President Trump's inaction against the mob assault underway at the Capitol. Mr. Hirschman said something to Mr. Cipollone. He seemed to relay that, you know, the president 
didn't want anything done. Throughout this period, some of the president's most important political allies, family members, and senior staff all begged him to tell his supporters to disperse and go home. They included Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, and other allies at Fox News, his son, Donald Trump Jr., the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, others in Congress and officials in the cabinet and executive branch, all of them made appeals to Donald Trump, which he rejected and he ignored. The select committee interviewed several people who were in the dining room with Donald Trump that afternoon, and every single one of these witnesses told us that he was watching the violent battles rage on television. He did not call his Secretary of Defense or the National Guard, the Chief of the Capitol Police, or the Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department. And to your knowledge, was the president in that private dining room the whole time that the attack on the Capitol was going on? Or did he ever go, to, again, only to your knowledge, to the Oval Office, to the White House Situation Room, anywhere else? To the best of my recollection, he was always in the dining room. Okay. Yeah, did, what did they say, Mr. Meadows or the president? At all, during that brief encounter that you were in the dining room? What do you recall? I think they were, I really was watching the TV. Do you know whether... He was watching TV in the dining room when uh, you talked to him on January 6th? Um, it's my understanding he was watching television. When you were in the dining room in these discussions, was the, uh, was the, the violence at the Capitol visible on the screen on the, in the, tel on the television? Yes. As the president watched the bloody attack unfold on Fox News from his dining room, members of Congress and other government officials stepped into the gigantic leadership void created by the president's chilling and studied passivity that day. What you're about to see is previously unseen footage of congressional leaders, both Republicans and Democrats, as they were taken to a secure location during the riot. You'll see how everyone involved was working actively to stop the violence, to get federal law enforcement deployed to the scene to put down the violence and secure the Capitol complex. Not just Democrats like Speaker Nancy Pelosi and House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, but Republicans like Vice President Pence, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Majority Whip John Thune, and countless other appointees across the administration. All of them did what President Trump was not doing what he simply refused to do. Take a listen. Uh, we're, start, we're starting to get surrounded. They're taking the uh, north front scaffolding. Unless we get more munitions, we are not gonna be able to hold. The door has been breached and people are gaining access into the Capitol. We have got to get finished the proceedings, or else they would have had to come to USA! USA! Senator Schumer is at a secure location, and they're locked down in the Senate. There has to be some way we can maintain the sense that people have that there's uh, some security or some confidence that government can function and that we can elect the president of the United States. Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on tear gas masks to prepare for a breach. Well, I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. <laughs> We need an area for the house members. They're all walking over now through the tunnels. I'm going to call up the effing secretary of DOD. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. right now and see what uh, other outreach she has to other police departments, as Senator uh, Leader Hoyer has mentioned. Hi, Governor. Uh, this is Nancy. 
Governor, I don't know if you have been approached about the uh, Virginia National Guard. Mr. Hoyer was connect, uh, speaking to uh, uh, Governor Hogan, uh, but I still think you probably need the okay of the, uh, the federal government in order to come into another jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh my gosh, they're just breaking windows, they're doing all, all kinds of, it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot, it's just, it's just horrendous, and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor, I appreciate what you're doing, and if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Virginia Guard has been called in. You know, I'm just talking to Governor Northam, and what he said is, they sent 200 of uh, state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety. personal safety is it just transcends everything. But the fact is, on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways. And quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the President of the United States. And now, uh, if, if he could, could at least uh, somebody. Yeah, why don't you get the President to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility? A public statement they should all leave. This cannot be just we're waiting for so-and-so. We need them there now, whoever you got. You okay? have you also have troops. This is Steny Hoyer. Troops. Okay. We, so we have a Fort little bit of time Air, to make that decision. Andrews Air Force Base. All right. Other military bases. Thank you. We Thanks, need Paul. active Bye. duty, National Guard. How soon in the future can you have the place evacuated and pulled you know, cleaned out? Well, just pretend, just pretend for a moment it was the Pentagon or the White House or some other entity that was under siege. And let me say, you can logistically get people there as you make the plan. We're trying to figure out how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. He, uh, he's not in the room right now, but he was with us earlier uh, and said, you know, we want to expedite this and hopefully they could confine it to just one complaint, Arizona, and then we could vote and, and that would be, you know, then just move forward with the rest of the state. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. What we are being told very directly is it's going to take days for the Capitol to be okay again. We've gotten a very bad report about the condition of, of the um, house floor with defecation and all that kind of thing as well. I don't think that that's hard to clean up, but I do think it is uh, more from a security standpoint of making sure that everybody is out of the building and how long will that take. I just got off with the vice president. And I got off with the vice president-elect. So I'll tell you. Okay. But what we left the conversation with, because he said he had the impression from Mitch that Mitch wants to get everybody back to do it there. Yes. I said that what we're getting a counterpoint that is, we could take time uh, to clean up the poo poo that they're making all over the, literally and figuratively in the Capitol, and that uh, it may take days to get back. Good news. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Good news.
In this video, you just saw Senator Chuck Schumer urging Acting Attorney General Jeff Rosen to get President Trump to call off the rioters. Of course, Acting AG Rosen did take action to defend the government, as did many other officials, but congressional leadership recognized on a bipartisan basis that President Trump was the only person who could get the mob to end its violent siege of the Congress, leave the Capitol, and go home. Here's Senator McConnell speaking after January 6th about how President Trump abandoned his duties and failed to do his job. It was obvious that only President Trump could end this. He was the only one who could. Former aides publicly begged him to do so. Loyal allies frantically called the administration. The president did not act swiftly. He did not do his job. He didn't take steps so federal law could be faithfully executed and order restored. No. In the midst of this violent chaos, Kevin McCarthy implored Donald Trump to tell his supporters in the mob to leave the Capitol. And when that didn't work, McCarthy called Trump's adult children to try to get them to intercede with Trump to call off the insurrectionary violence. In our prior hearings, we showed you a description of what McCarthy told Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler about his conversation with Trump during the violence. Another witness, Mick Mulvaney, President Trump's former chief of staff, has also come forward and corroborated her shocking account. You know, I asked Kevin McCarthy, who's the Republican leader, about this, um, and he said he called Donald Trump. He finally got through to Donald Trump, and he said, "You have got to get on TV. You've got to get on Twitter. You've got to call these people off." You know what the president said to him? This is as it's happening. He said, "Well, Kevin, these are my people. You know, these are these are Antifa." And Kevin responded and said, no, they're your people. They literally just came through my office windows, and my staff are running for cover. I mean, they're running for their lives. You need to call them off. And the president's response to Kevin, to me, was chilling. He said, well, Kevin, I guess they're just more upset about the election uh, you know, theft than you are. And that's, you know, you've seen widespread reports of, of Kevin McCarthy and the president having a, basically a swearing conversation. That's when the swearing commenced, because the president was basically saying, no, nah, I... I'm okay with this. Um, I had I had a conversation at some point in the day or week after uh, the uh, the riot with Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, it was very similar to what Jamie had. Uh, the conversation she had re retold about how he called and asked the president to get them to stop, and the president told him something along the lines of, "Kevin, maybe these people are just more angry about this than you are. Maybe more upset." I had a conversation similar to that with Kevin in the day to week after, after the riot. And we know how Kevin McCarthy described President Trump's conduct, both in public and in private. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Accept his share of responsibility, quell the brewing unrest, and ensure President-elect Biden is able to successfully begin his term. But let me be very clear to all of you, and I've been very clear to the president. He bears responsibilities for his words and actions. No ifs, ands, or buts. I asked him personally today, does he hold responsibility for what happened? Does he feel bad about what happened? He told me he does have some responsibility for what happened. Um, and he needs to acknowledge that. 2.24 p.m., knowing the deadly riot was now bearing down on his own vice president, President Trump composed and sent a tweet attacking Vice President Pence, accusing him of cowardice for not unilaterally rejecting electoral college votes for Joe Biden and simply handing Trump the presidency. The impact of that tweet was foreseeable and predictable. It further inflamed the mob, which was chanting, hang Mike Pence, and provoked them to even greater violence. This deliberate decision to further enrage the mob against Vice President Pence 
cannot be justified by anything that President Trump might have thought about the election. The tweet came precisely at the time Pence's Secret Service detail was most seriously concerned for the vice president's physical safety. We've obtained new documents from the Secret Service, real-time chats that underscore the threat they knew the vice president would be facing because of the president's escalating incitement of the mob. After Trump's tweet, one agent in the Secret Service's intelligence division immediately warned, POTUS just tweeted about Pence, probably not going to be good for Pence. Another agent reported the dramatic impact of Trump's anti-Pence tweet on his followers. POTUS said he lacked courage, over 24,000 likes in under two minutes. Employees at Twitter were nervously monitoring the situation. They knew that certain Twitter users were rioting at the Capitol and tweeting about it at the same time. As the afternoon progressed, the company detected a surge in violent hashtags on the platform, including lines of lethal incitement like, execute Mike Pence. Listen to this former Twitter employee, Anika Navaroli, who first came to the committee anonymously, but has now bravely agreed to be named because she wants to speak out about the magnitude of the threats facing our people. And you were also seeing content on the platform at that time um, that was threatening towards the vice president. Hashtag, yes. I my pants. They were literally calling for his execution. As this tweet was going out. Yes, and after, in response to this tweet too, because I think as, as many of as many of Donald Trump's tweets did, it again fanned the flames. And it was individuals who were already constructing gallows, who were already willing and able and wanting to execute someone and looking for someone to be killed. Now the individual who has called upon them to begin this coup is now pointing the finger at another individual um, while they're ready mm -hmm. to do this. Here's a small sample of the reactions that President Trump's Fan the Flames tweet provoked among Capitol rioters in real time. What percentage of the crowd is going to the Capitol? 100 percent. It is, it, it is spread like wildfire that Pence has betrayed us and everybody's marching on the Capitol, all million of us. It's insane. Between 2.30 and 2.35, within 10 minutes of President Trump's tweet, thousands of rioters overran the line that the Metropolitan Police Force's Civil Disturbance Unit was holding on the west side of the Capitol. This was the first time in the history of the Metropolitan Police Department that a security line like that had ever been broken. President Trump's conduct that day was so shameful and so outrageous that it prompted numerous members of the White House staff and other Trump appointees to resign. In prior hearings, you've heard Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger and Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews explain why they felt compelled to resign on that day. Since then, we've spoken to more high-ranking officials, like President Trump's envoy to Northern Ireland and former Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, who resigned after the 6th in protest of Trump's misconduct and to dissociate themselves from his role in the violence. Take a listen to what they had to say. I was stunned by violence and uh, was stunned by the president's apparent indifference to the violence. And that was the time for the president presidential. I thought he failed at doing it. I thought he failed at a, at a critical time to be the sort of leader that the, the nation needed. I think the events at the Capitol, uh, however they occurred, were shocking. And it was something that, as I mentioned in my statement, that I could not put aside. And at a particular point, the events were such that it was impossible for me to continue, given my personal values and my philosophy. I came as an immigrant to this country. I believe in this country. 
I believe in a peaceful transfer of power. I believe in democracy. And so I was a, it was a, a decision that I made on my own. When security assistance began to arrive at the Capitol and the tide turned against the insurrection, President Trump finally gave his painfully belated instruction at 4.17 p.m. So after multiple hours of rioting and more than 100 serious injuries suffered by our law enforcement officers, the crowd finally began to disperse. Listen carefully to what they said as they decided to leave the Capitol. Finally, at 6.01, President Trump tweeted again, not to condemn the mass violence in any way, but rather to excuse and glorify it. Significantly, he made it clear that he considered the violence perfectly foreseeable and predictable. Check it out. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously, viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly, unfairly treated for so long. These are the things that happen, he said, giving the whole game away. Trump was telling us that the vice president, the Congress, and all the injured and wounded cops, some of whom are with us today, got what was coming to us. According to Trump, January 6th should not be a day that lives in shame and infamy in our history, but rather in glory. Remember this day forever, he wrote proudly, as if he were talking about D-Day or the Battle of Yorktown. Trump did nothing to stop the deadly violence for obvious reasons. He thought it was all justified, he incited it, and he supported it. Would it have been possible at any moment for the president to walk down to the podium in the briefing room and, and tell, talk to the nation at any time between when you first gave him that advice at 2 o'clock and 417 when the video statement? Would that have been possible? Would it have been possible? Yes. Yes. The president had wanted to make a statement um, and address the American people, he could have been on camera almost instantly. And conversely, the White House press corps has offices that are located directly behind the briefing room. And so if he had wanted to make an address from the Oval Office, we could have assembled the White House press corps probably in a matter of minutes to get them into the Oval for him to do an on-camera address. Mr. Chairman, nothing in law or fact could justify the president's failure to act. And, and I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. Mr. Chairman, in numerous places, our Constitution strongly opposes insurrection and rebellion. Article 1 gives Congress the power to call forth the militia to suppress insurrections. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualified from holding federal and state office anyone who has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution but betrays it by engaging in insurrection or rebellion. It was President Lincoln at the start of the Civil War in 1861 who best explained why democracy rejects insurrection. Insurrection, he said, is a war upon the first principle of popular government, the rights of the people. American democracy belongs to all the American people, not to a single man. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. During this committee's first hearing in July of last year, our witnesses were four police officers who helped repel the riots of January 6th. We asked them what they hoped to see the committee accomplish over the course of our investigation. Officer Gunnell wanted to know why the rioters were made to believe that the election process was rigged. Officer Fanon asked us to look into the actions and activities that resulted in the day's events. Officer Hodges was concerned about whether anyone in power had a role. Officer Dunn put it simply, 
get to the bottom of what happened. We've worked for more than a year to get those answers. We've conducted more than a thousand interviews and depositions. We received and reviewed hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. Thanks to the tireless work of our members and investigators, we've left, we have left no doubt, none that Donald Trump led an effort to upend American democracy that directly resulted in the violence of January 6th. He tried to take away the voice of the American people in choosing their president and replace the will of the voters with his will to remain in power. He is the one person at the center of the story of what happened on January 6th. So we want to hear from him. The committee needs to do everything in our power to tell the most complete story possible and provide recommendations to help ensure nothing like January 6th ever happens again. We need to be fair and thorough and gain a full context for the evidence we've obtained. But the need for this committee to hear from Donald Trump goes beyond our fact-finding. This is a question about accountability to the American people. He must be accountable. He is required to answer for his actions. He's required to answer to those police officers who put their lives and bodies on the line to defend our democracy. He's required to answer to those millions of Americans who votes he wanted to throw out as part of his scheme to remain in power. And whatever is underway to ensure this accountability under law, this committee will demand a full accounting to every American person of the events of January 6th. So it is our obligation to seek Donald Trump's testimony. There's precedent in American history for Congress to compel the testimony of a president. president. There's also precedent for presidents to provide testimony and documentary evidence to congressional investigators. We also recognize that a subpoena to a former president is a serious and extraordinary action. That's why we want to take this step in full view of the American people, especially because the subject matter at issue is so important to the American people and the stakes are so high for our future and our democracy. And so I recognize the vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, to offer a motion. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to today's notice, I send to the desk a committee resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. Committee Resolution 1, resolved, that the chairman be and is hereby directed to subpoena Donald J. Trump for documents and testimony in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol, pursuant to Section 5C4 of House Resolution 503 and Clause 2M of Rule 11 of the Rules of the House of Representatives. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized on her resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our committee now has sufficient information to answer many of the critical questions posed by Congress at the outset. We have sufficient information to consider criminal referrals for multiple individuals and to recommend a range of legislative proposals to guard against another January 6th. But a key task remains. We must seek the testimony under oath of January 6th central player. More than 30 witnesses in our investigation have invoked their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And several of those did so specifically in response to questions about their dealings with Donald Trump directly. Here are a few examples. This is Roger Stone with Oath Keepers at the Willard Hotel on the morning of January 6th. And here is Mr. Stone testifying before our committee. Did you speak to President Trump on his private cell phone on either January 5th or January 6th? 
Uh, once again, on advice of counsel, I will assert my Fifth Amendment right to respectfully decline to answer your question. This is General Michael Flynn walking with Oath Keepers on December 12th, 2020. And here is General Flynn's testimony before our committee. Did you, General Flynn, talk to President Trump at any point on January 6, 2021? The fifth. Here is John Eastman fraudulently instructing tens of thousands of angry protesters that the vice president could change the election outcome on January 6th. Later on this same day, Dr. Eastman acknowledged in writing that Donald Trump knew what he was attempting was illegal. Here is John Eastman testifying before our committee. Did President Trump authorize you to discuss publicly your January 4th, 2021 conversation with him? Fifth. So is it your position that you can discuss in the media direct conversations you had with the President of the United States, but you will not discuss those same conversations with this committee? Fifth. Here is Jeff Clark, who conspired with Donald Trump to corrupt the Department of Justice. President Trump wanted to appoint Jeff Clark as acting attorney general. And as you can see in this call log we obtained from the National Archives, he did so. And here is Mr. Clark testifying before our committee. Mr. Clark, when did you first talk directly with President Trump? Fifth. Uh, Mr. Clark, did you discuss with President Trump allegations of fraud in the 2020 election? Fifth. Other witnesses have also gone to enormous lengths to avoid testifying about their dealings with Donald Trump. Steve Bannon has been tried and convicted by a jury of his peers for contempt of Congress. He is scheduled to be sentenced for this crime later this month. Criminal proceedings regarding Peter Navarro continue. And Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, has refused to testify based upon executive privilege. The committee's litigation with him continues. Mr. Chairman, at some point, the Department of Justice may well unearth the facts that these and other witnesses are currently concealing. But our duty today is to our country and our children and our Constitution. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. And every American is entitled to those answers so we can act now to protect our republic. So this afternoon, I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. If there's no further debate, the question is on agreeing to the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed is no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Cheney. Aye. Ms. Cheney, aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Mr. Schiff. Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mrs. Murphy? Aye. Mrs. Murphy, aye. Mr. Raskin? Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Mrs. Luria? Aye. Mrs. Luria, aye. Mr. Kinzinger? Kinzinger, aye. Mr. Kinzinger, aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. The clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes and zero noes. The resolution is agreed to. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The chair requests that those in the hearing room remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.
The House Select Committee wrapping up what may be their last public hearing before they issue a report on the events surrounding the attack on the Capitol on January 6. But their work is not done. In addition to that report, they are also subpoenaing former President Donald Trump to come before them and answer questions. Members painted a portrait today of Trump's state of mind in knowing he had lost the 2020 election and yet publicly denying that loss, and then the efforts to subvert the election and overthrow the will of the people on January 6. This is live coverage in The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. I'm joined by James Homan here in the newsroom this afternoon. James, let's start with the news that we ended with here at this committee today, the subpoena uh, of the former President Donald Trump. A somber roll call vote, uh, significant, in the words of Benny Thompson, extraordinary move that we heard them explain why they feel is justified. Uh, we'll see how the former president responds. Uh, the clock is ticking on this committee. The midterms are less than a month away. Uh, we saw the footage there at the end of all the people who have not cooperated, uh, who have not answered questions about their conversations with Donald Trump. And this is a, a, the most aggressive action that this committee, which has taken many aggressive actions, has taken since starting last year. Uh, and putting the onus in today's hearing and with the subpoena squarely on Donald Trump, who, as they presented today, was central to the events of January 6th. James, what do we know about the president's, former president's legal abilities in, in this moment to respond to, deny, or answer the subpoena? Well, it's, you know, subpoena, they have subpoena authority. It is a valid subpoena. There is a scenario where Congress could vote to hold Donald Trump in contempt of Congress. Perhaps during the lame duck session, it would be up to the Justice Department uh, to decide whether that would be prosecuted the way that Steve Bannon was prosecuted for rejecting a subpoena uh, from this committee. Uh, but that would be an extraordinary step. Uh, no former president has ever been indicted uh, for for a crime, any crime, especially a crime like this. You know, we just saw an image of those four police officers uh, that were referenced. This hearing series going full circle, as uh, we heard uh, from the chairman reminding us that each of those officers had asked for something out of this committee, and the committee hoping they delivered on their requests. James, I want to watch a moment from earlier today when we saw this extended footage of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She was in a room with other members of congressional leadership, and they're making calls to members of the Trump administration in what looks like desperate pleas and demands for information and help. Oh my gosh, they're just breaking windows, they're doing all, all kinds of, I mean, it's really, that somebody, they said somebody was shot, it's just, it's just horrendous, and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor, I appreciate what you're doing, and if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch, thank you. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye. Virginia Guard has been called in. You know, I'm just talking to Governor Northam, and what he said is, they sent 200 of state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety. personal safety is it just transcends everything. But the fact is, on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways. And quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the President of the United States. And now, uh, if, if he could, could at least uh, somebody. Yeah, why don't you get the President to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility? A public statement they should all leave. Footage from January 6th. We're now joined by senior congressional correspondent Paul Kane by phone. Uh, PK, tell us about what we know of that footage. Uh, yeah, um, Libby, it comes courtesy of Alex Pelosi, the, uh, the daughter of the House Speaker, and she's a longtime documentary filmmaker. And she uh, spent that day with the Speaker. I saw her on multiple occasions, um, including a long conversation we had after uh, order was restored and sort of the well, Congress went back into session. I remember talking to her and her husband and Sean Patrick Maloney in the middle of the rotunda somewhere around midnight, January 6th, um, 
she had spent that day essentially with her, her mother and was evacuated out with them. Um, Jackie Alamany, our colleague inside the room today, who's been covering the January 6th committee uh, moments better than anybody, was able to confirm with the committee aides that that was indeed where this incredible video was, came from. It's uh, Alex Pelosi, a documentary filmmaker who has on her hands and some really incredible uh, hours of footage that she has had to, behind the scenes looking at her mother for the last several years, um, and this is one of the first times we're actually getting a real glimpse of it. Um, not exactly the standard documentary film, make, film that you would get, but uh, that's where it came from. You know, remembering that, of course, it's coming from a filmmaker, the daughter of the Speaker of the House, the footage shows Nancy Pelosi in charge, PK. I mean, she's trying to sort of command things and figure out just what to do in the absence of leadership from the White House. Yeah, the, this it, it makes clear that you have a a, a real abdication of the entire national security apparatus by the president of the United States at that point. Um, you know, we have seen in previous footage uh, Mike Pence uh, inside a sort of parking lot bunker in the basement of the Capitol Visitor Center. He was he was doing similar work, calling calling up uh, military leaders, guard, National Guard, ordering issuing orders. Um, at one point in the video today, you saw her. Pelosi speaking with Pence, um, you know, it was clear that every member of Congress in a congressional leadership, you get the top five of each chamber essentially were whisked away to this military uh, facility not too far from the Capitol. And um, they were all trying to basically fill the role that had been had been abdicated by Trump. And so everybody was doing their part, including obviously Speaker Pelosi. Um, as you saw her there the, in the clip you just showed, she was talking to Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia, who was governor at the time and was, you know, sitting on thousands of National Guard and state police and others that he could deploy to try and help secure the Capitol. Uh, PK, we saw members of Republican leadership, as you talked about, where the leadership was all taken. We saw Democrats and Republicans working together at certain points there. And this, the montage sort of ends with Speaker Pelosi coordinating with and talking with Vice President Pence. So across party lines, sort of all sort of working towards a common goal there. Uh, yes, it's not something that you, you see or hear right now in the American political uh, theater. It is much more hyper-partisan and lobbying charges at one another. Um, but in that moment, uh, in that hour or a couple hours after uh, the attack began, uh, you, you definitely saw a unified front, at least among the congressional leaders in the House and Senate. Um, might not have been the case with some over in the House where rank and file had uh, bunkered in a uh, massive committee hearing room, and it, it got a little bit... Um, partisan over there, but uh, and the leaders themselves were working together in concert with Mike Pence and other members of the cabinet. Senior Congressional Correspondent Paul Kane, thanks so much for joining us. Let's bring Rhonda Colvin into the conversation. Rhonda, one aspect of seeing that footage is it's very visceral, and I don't know about you, but it really takes me back to that day and those moments when people like yourself were at the Capitol. Paul Kane was talking about what he witnessed and experienced that very night, many hours after uh, the attackers were finally cleared from the Capitol grounds. Um, what was the room like in the hearing room as they played that footage? I think everyone uh, was uh, in somewhat shock, perhaps. I mean, it does take you, as you just said, it does take you back to that day and how fragile things were. And I know I was sitting there thinking about, and I've thought about this many times as I've been covering this panel for the last year, how different things could have been if just a hair went wrong, if just one step, uh, you know, around a corner, you could have had a lawmaker who died that day. We could have been covering funerals of lawmakers because we learned from some of the Secret Service uh, communications today that uh, many of the people who were here did want to harm these lawmakers. So you just think back to that day, how fragile and perilous everything was. And I know that uh, that video of Pelosi and the leadership in both the House and Senate 
that, that was breathtaking to me. It just showed you basically a TikTok of how chaotic things were, how no one knew what type of help would arrive. You had Steny Hoyer trying to uh, help call in the uh, Maryland National Guard. He's from Maryland. You had Pelosi on the phone speaking with uh, Vice President Pence. It all rose above the politics that we are very accustomed to right now. It showed uh, the danger and, and how uh, perilous everything was that day. So yes, it certainly took me back. In fact, that last scene of the uh, video clip with Pelosi, she's walking back through uh, into the Capitol. Lindsay Sitz, who was uh, my colleague here with me that day, we passed her and that team on the way out in, in pretty much the same spot where you see that video end. And it, it just really took me back to that day. And that day, just it just doesn't seem like it's finished. Thanks so much, Rhonda Colvin. Uh, James, let's go to you for the aftermath of this, because I just want to stay on this for one more moment. Seeing that footage is so stunning because you do see people working across party lines to sort of resolve the situation in the Capitol, make sure everyone is safe, and then proceed forward. And they even played that footage of Mitch McConnell talking on the Senate floor. And then if you fast forward, you know, from January 6, 2021 to October 13th, 2022, it's like that ability to work across party lines and try to confront this attempt to overthrow democracy, that has really changed because Republicans are back on a different side now. Yeah, uh, Visceral is exactly right. When you watch that footage, you really do get the sense that it was this fog of war with Pelosi saying it might be days before they were able to safely get back into the Capitol, talking about uh, poo-poo in Pelosi's word that literally and figuratively where they were defecating on various staircases. But to your point, you know, we saw that clip of Mitch McConnell explaining his decision to vote against convicting Trump. Uh, and we also heard audio, didn't see video, from Elaine Chao, who is McConnell's wife, giving a deposition since the last January 6th hearing, explaining her decision, which she said she made on her own, to resign as transportation secretary for Donald Trump. You know, September 11th was this moment where the country really came together, both parties. Uh, I think a lot of us thought that COVID might be another moment like that. And then I think even more of us thought January 6th could be this moment uh, where the, the country sort of broke this collective partisan fever. Uh, you heard that uh, clip today, audio of Jamie Herrera Butler, the Congresswoman from Washington State talking about Kevin McCarthy's uh, profanity laced conversation with Donald Trump, uh, where Trump said they're angrier than you are, Kevin. And uh, Kevin McCarthy went a week after that uh, to Mar-a-Lago to go see Donald Trump a week after the inauguration. Uh, so it, it, it is one of those hinge points in history where it really could have gone another way. It seemed that day like there was this moment of, uh, of, of coming together and saying this isn't who we are. And for tribalistic partisan reasons, uh, Donald Trump in, in many ways has a stronger grip on the Republican Party today than he did on January 6th, certainly than he did on January 7th of last year. Rhonda, let's go back to you on Capitol Hill for the major takeaways from today's hearing and just how successful the committee was at trying to draw this line between Donald Trump and what happened on January 6th. Well, the day started out with just reviewing some of the facts that we've already been through in the earlier hearings. And then they did sprinkle in some new items. Of course, we heard more about uh, what the Secret Service turned over. We learned that the Secret Service knew days, weeks ahead, that they had intelligence showing almost spot on what would happen here that day. So there is documentation now that they were aware how dangerous things could get. And of course, the headline uh, of the latter part of today's meeting is that this committee has said that they hold Donald Trump fully accountable for the evidence that they found that he was at the center of all of this and they are going to subpoena him. And that right there is historic. So that uh, is how this committee is choosing to leave off. I thought it was uh, very interesting that uh, Liz Cheney actually read uh, the beginnings of that resolution and explained why they are doing this. And I also thought it was interesting that they took a voice vote. They didn't have to do that. They all said aye. They decided to all go on record um, to vote for this subpoena. So it really is now about watching next steps. Of course, it's likely that uh, the former president or perhaps his lawyers might send out a statement and respond to this action. But it is a historic day right now that the committee is choosing to end this investigation with subpoenaing Donald Trump. Now, will he comply? 
you know, there's a lot of evidence uh, from the beginning of his administration until now uh, that you might think that, no, he won't comply. Uh, but, of course, the, the committee has subpoena power, and they also have the power to vote on holding him in contempt. So we'll see if uh, that whole process will play out like it did for Steve Bannon or uh, the others, Mark Meadows, um, and if those contempt charges would be voted on by the full House and then sent over to the DOJ. But it's a really historic day here. Uh, right now, I, I um, am fighting the urge to run over across here to the hall. It looks like Benny Thompson uh, is, is trying to speak to some reporters. But again, uh, this, this was a pretty important uh, end or probable end to this committee's work. Ron Dick, you need to run and do that. We'll stay right here. We'll wait for you to come back. So uh, follow your reporter instincts. Um, I want to go to James uh, to pick up on something that Rhonda was talking about, this question of, of course, holding people in contempt and also pulling that thread of subpoenaing President Trump. Something else that we heard from the committee was the phrase criminal referrals and whether or not they had collected enough evidence, they believe, to make some criminal referrals. Tell us more. Yeah, that was uh, real significant news there at the end because there has been a debate inside the committee about whether to have criminal referrals, uh, whether it was worthwhile and made sense. And we heard Liz Cheney say, we have sufficient information to consider multiple criminal referrals. Uh, and that is meaningful. There's a subcommittee of the broader committee with four members who are lawyers, including Liz Cheney and Adam Schiff, Zoe Lofgren, and Jamie Raskin. Uh, it, it, multiple is significant because it means it wouldn't just be uh, potentially Donald Trump, but also others, uh, including someone like a, a Jeff Clark, uh, who they showed the video of him pleading the fifth. And then the other uh, thing that we heard from Congressman Pete Aguilar from California right after the recess was that there is going to be evidence, which they didn't get into today, in their final report when it comes that suggests possible criminal obstruction related to the uh, recollections of the uh, what was going on with Trump in the SUV as he left the ellipse after the Stop the Steal rally to go back to the White House. Uh, you heard, uh, you know, we, we know that members of the Secret Service were uh, had depositions, uh, and basically what he was implying was that they were not fully forthcoming or they didn't turn over the appropriate documents. Uh, and, and so that gets to the Cassidy Hutchinson story about Trump wanting to go to the Capitol, Trump lunging at the driver of his suburban to go back to the White House. Also, news coming out of this afternoon. Mm, that's a, it's an important point because there was a discrepancy, sort of a rebuttal of what Cassidy Hutchinson said. And then there's been, James, this sort of, well, actually, a lot of reporting The Washington Post has done, led especially by Carol Lenning, about just what did unfold uh, in that crucial time period and just how Donald Trump acted. Yeah, it's one thing to say something uh, on background to a reporter uh, or to deny something uh, in, a, in a statement or a tweet. It's another to say it under oath. And so we, we heard, uh, you know, sources close to Ornato and Engel, the Secret Service agents denying Cassidy Hutchinson's sworn testimony, but they have not uh, appeared before the committee uh, to testify under oath to, uh, or, or issued any kind of signed affidavit denying Hutchinson's version of events. Rhonda, one person you previewed for us that would come into play here was Roger Stone. And I know you talked to the uh, Scandinavian filmmaker, one of them who's involved in that uh, recording and documenting of Roger Stone in that crucial time period of the election and its aftermath. Talk to us about we, what we heard and witnessed of his involvement. Right. The clip we saw uh, from that film showed Roger Stone discussing that you just take elections. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that was uh, one of the suggestions he told supporters. You take elections or there will be violence uh, that will happen if that doesn't uh, work out. He said, uh, I think the phrase was, we'll smash pumpkins. And uh, it showed, if you looked at the timestamp of when that video was shot, it was in November, before the election, before the 2020 election. So it shows that folks around the former president, uh, they were thinking that if they don't win, you know, before any votes were counted, that they were going to go ahead and assume power. So that, that was an important detail that the committee wanted to share with people, that this was not like what we were told a, a year and a half ago, that uh, this was a group of impassioned individuals that just came here 
here and, and were just upset about the election results, there was a lot of planning, there was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of chatter. And so the, the committee wanted to use parts of that film to show that there was evidence of that. And I spoke to that filmmaker uh, earlier today, and, and he had planned to be in the hearing room as well. And he told me he was very hesitant to allow the committee to use his film. He said, as a journalist, you want your work to be published to the public, and then they make their own determinations. And he, he really didn't, he didn't seem to want this to be some sort of publicity moment for him. Uh, but he said the argument for holding on to the uh, film that he had of Roger Stone just just didn't feel right when you consider the stakes of this investigation. So that's why he uh, gave this information and shared this information with the committee. Well, someone else uh, we heard footage from today, Rhonda, in that lead up to the election and talking about just what might happen was audio from Steve Bannon, Trump advisor. Now, this comes from October 31st, 2020, so it's the week before Election Day. And Bannon's talking about how he believes a President Trump would handle losing the election. Let's listen. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. It, but it, that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs vote in May. And so they're going to have a natural disadvantage, and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. <laughs> also, also if, Trump <laughs> is, if Trump is losing mm. by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, mm. it's going to be even crazier. No, because he's going to sit right there and say they stole it. I'm, yeah. going to court, uh, Agree. I'm directing the attorney general mm. to shut down all ballot places in all 50 states. It's going to be no. <laughs> he's not going out easy. If, Trump, if Biden's winning, Trump is going to do some crazy shit. Steve Bannon talking in the week before Election Day in 2020. James, how damning is that tape? That gets at the idea that this was premeditated. Uh, it's Trump's state of mind that even before the election, he was prepared to declare victory, uh, he, whether he won or lost, that uh, f facts didn't matter to him, uh, that he was determined to cling to power. And the reason this tape from Bannon is significant is because Bannon refused to cooperate with this committee. Uh, we know that he had a phone call with Trump. Uh, we, we obviously have seen a lot of footage of his War Room podcast. Uh, and Bannon uh, refused to testify before the committee, and so this audio of con comments before the election, contemporaneous evidence that gets directly at President Trump's intent. You know, James, today's focus was really on Trump, but what do we know about how this series of hearings has affected Trump's popularity overall? So Trump's popularity has softened somewhat among Republicans, but it is still overwhelmingly high. And in fact, Trump is more popular among Republicans uh, right now. More Republicans think Trump should run again in 2024, I should say, than Democrats think that Biden should run again in 2024. It's pretty remarkable. The latest Washington Post poll, uh, which was conducted uh, in late September, asked if it was a head-to-head -head matchup, the current president versus the former president, a rematch of 2020, Donald Trump wins that race 48-46. Now, that's within the margin of error, three and a half points. But this is hugely significant. The, the idea that uh, Donald Trump could return to power in 2025 is very real. Uh, it's not academic. And it's a reminder that uh, I think Joe Biden would love to run against Trump again. But Democrats shouldn't be confident that that is a, a race they would necessarily win. You know, James, it's always hard to tell from those polls because there's a natural pushback oftentimes about the person who's actually in power and mm -hmm. uh, a future President Trump is really theoretical. Uh, but the numbers themselves are very revealing about how the public feels and whether or not this committee process has really changed the public sentiment of Republicans in particular about Donald Trump. Yeah, you know, the inflation numbers today showed 8.6 percent inflation last month. Uh, and you look at the polls, that's the number one issue. Uh, January 6th, much farther down the list. And that doesn't mean the work that this committee is doing isn't vital, but it is a reminder that, uh, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, you know, you look at uh, George W. Bush, left office incredibly unpopular 
in uh, January 2009. And two years later, uh, more than 55% of Americans had a favorable impression of him again. Some of that was because he wasn't an active candidate. Uh, and, and the same dynamic is playing out to some degree with Trump, even though he is continuing to hold rallies all the time. Uh, he continues to be deeply polarizing. You, as many people detest him as love him, uh, but he does have a core of support. And he really has, despite clearly knowing uh, otherwise, convinced a majority of Republicans that he won the 2020 election, which of course he did not. James, what happens now from here? Let's talk about what happens for these committee members as well as what work they have yet to get done uh, before the end of the year. Yeah, so the two Republicans on this committee, Libby, will not be in the next Congress. Uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, uh, both gone. Kinzinger didn't run again. Cheney lost her primary. Stephanie Murphy, the moderate blue dog Democrat from Central Florida, uh, also choosing not to run again. Uh, and so this is the kind of the tail end of their congressional career. They have to put out a report. Originally, they wanted to put this big report out before the midterms. It appears that is not going to happen now. So it's putting out the report. Obviously, we're going to have uh, a big fight over this subpoena. Uh, it, obviously, they're still trying to get other people to come talk to them. Uh, they want this issue to be front and center going into the elections. I think it is just going to be hard because we're in political season now. Uh, so I expect we'll see them probably one more time at the very least to come forward and talk about their report. Uh, we're going to see that uh, referral subcommittee basically uh, send recommendations to the Justice Department of who uh, should be indicted. That's not up to uh, them ultimately, they just can make a referral and a recommendation, and it's up to the Justice Department whether to bring charges. Let's go back to Capitol Hill. Rhonda Colvin has a member of the Select Committee with her. Rhonda? I do, Libby. I have Representative Raskin here with me. He, of course, he's on this panel. He, you were one of the last people to speak, actually, toward the end of today's hearing. Uh, I guess the major headline right now is that you all voted to subpoena the former president. If you could tell me, uh, A, if he complies, does the committee expect a full account from him? And if he doesn't comply, what's next? So we do expect um, the former president to comply because we've had more than a thousand witnesses and the vast majority of people we've called uh, have come to testify. Obviously, you've got the right to assert a privilege against self-incrimination if you think you might be exposing yourself to criminal prosecution. Uh, but there's really nothing that out of the ordinary about this. Uh, seven former presidents have testified in U.S. history, including two under subpoena, John Tyler and John Quincy Adams. Um, and um, in any event, one would think that uh, the former president would be eager to clear his name uh, if he didn't have responsibility for uh, inciting the insurrection and attempting to pull off a coup against the 2020 election. I mean, you could take a poll of a thousand people in America and ask them if they were accused of trying to overthrow an election and the constitutional order, would they come and testify? And I assume that all of them would come and say, of course I'll come and testify. I had nothing to do with that. Throughout the, the last set of hearings and today, there have been so many things that the committee has exposed um, throughout this investigation. But we also know that you all are winding down. Do you feel at all, with the knowledge that you have from this investigation, that winding down now might be premature? Well, uh, whether it's premature or not, alas, we have no choice, because in the House of Representatives, as you know, the whole Congress turns over every two years, unlike the Senate, uh, where they have staggered six-year terms and they're overlapping. So the Senate's a continuing body. The House of Representatives ends, and then a new House of Representatives begins. Um, so the clock is ticking for the end of the year. We just have a couple of months left. Um, we want to complete our entire factual investigation, which is why I think we just voted to issue this subpoena. Um, but also under House Resolution 503, we have to um, send forth uh, comprehensive legislative recommendations on how to protect American democracy against insurrections, coups, political violence, and electoral sabotage in the future. And what can people expect next? And can you give us a timeline of when the report will come out? Well, um, I, I can't give it to you exactly because I don't think it exists yet. Um, 
I, uh, I don't believe that the report will be out before uh, the elections, um, before um, early November, but uh, I'm hoping that we would have it done later in November or early in December. And my last question, too, going back to how expansive this investigation was, but yet it was kind of crunched into a little over a year. Are there any areas that you think the committee has not really looked into, or do you think you've covered it all? Well, we've certainly made inquiries and investigative initiative in all areas. We've looked at, um, you know, foreign connections. We've looked at domestic violent extremist groups. We looked at what happened in the social media. Uh, we looked at the president's inner circle. We looked at the attempt to get the legislatures to nullify the popular vote. We looked at attempts to get state election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to just manufacture votes and invent votes. We looked at what happened on January 6th and the plot to get Mike Pence to step outside his constitutional role. I think it's been pretty comprehensive, uh, but there are certain things that only Donald Trump can answer, and that's why we're we're issuing uh, this subpoena. All right. Representative Raskin, thank you so much for stopping by. Right. All right. Libby, I'll send things back to you. Thank you, Rhonda. So, James, there's a real question, though, of whether or not Donald Trump would talk to this committee and if he can somehow try to justify not talking to them because of his role as former president. Yeah. Uh, and he, you know, he never talked to Robert Mueller, the special counsel. He answered written questions. Uh, you, it, it's hard to imagine Trump sitting down under oath uh, in a setting he doesn't control. He'll call this part of a witch hunt. Uh, he already has. He'll say that you know they're out to get him. Uh, Congressman Raskin mentioned that you know more than a thousand people were talked to. But as Liz Cheney noted in her closing statement, more than 30 of the people who were subpoenaed didn't cooperate. Uh, they complied with the subpoena, but then invoked their Fifth Amendment. Uh, privilege against self-incrimination. And we saw video clips of Roger Stone, Michael Flynn, John Eastman, Jeffrey Clark, all invoking the fifth to uh, refuse answering questions about their conversations with Trump. Certainly Trump could make an argument for executive privilege. Uh, clearly, Congressman Raskin, uh, who was a constitutional law professor before he joined the House, uh, was ready and said, you know, there's all these precedents for people to come and talk often voluntarily. Uh, you know, but ultimately those legal arguments won't uh, move the ball that much if Trump uh, just flatly refuses to cooperate. James, in the time that we've been on air today uh, following this hearing, we have a reported story by Robert Barnes and Perry Stein looking at the Supreme Court and this question of those Mar-a-Lago documents. Update us on that. So the Supreme Court has declined uh, an emergency request from Donald Trump to uh, allow the special master to review classified documents that uh, were found in his possession at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, this is a blow to the former president. It's a reminder that just because uh, there were no stated dissents, uh, you know, just because three of the nine justices were appointed by Donald Trump doesn't mean that they're going to always take his side. Uh, it, it, and it's sort of a repudiation of Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida, who was appointed by Trump, but was overruled by the circuit court, which uh, is, is made up of a majority of Trump or Republican nominees. So it's, it's a blow to Trump. It's a win for the Justice Department. It, it means that the investigation essentially will be ongoing. So uh, many parallel things happening yeah. at once. Final thoughts from you today, James. Yeah, you're right. Uh, many parallel uh, things happening, including the New York Attorney General uh, filing another motion today uh, in that case surrounding the president. Ultimately, though, uh, what happened on January 6th was different, Libby. Uh, you, this uh, was a truly unprecedented event to have people breaching the Capitol this way. And uh, the committee, in their summation, really did a better job than they'd done in any of the previous hearings at centering this story around Donald Trump himself. Uh, before Election Day, uh, in the run-up to January 6th, on January 6th, and then in that period uh, before January 20th. Thanks so much, James. Rhonda, let's go to you live on Capitol Hill for your final thoughts this evening. 
Well, my final thoughts uh, are that this investigation is likely not over. Now, the congressional investigation may be over, but what I'm thinking about when we, we talk about the effectiveness of this committee is that people started talking. These other uh, investigations, such as uh, over at the DOJ or even just like a mile and a half from here, uh, you have a, a trial going on with Stuart Rhodes and other members of the Oath Keepers where we're finding out information of their plans from the 6th. There, there was so much out there now that would not have been had there not been a congressional investigation. And while that investigation might be wrapping up soon, the story still continues, and that's what I'm left thinking today. All right. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Well, that wraps up our coverage of today's hearing and possibly of this series of hearings. But, of course, the committee says it has more work to do, including that report that Congressman Raskin was just talking about and waiting to see what happens with that subpoena for former President Donald Trump. I'd like to thank my guests today and throughout our coverage of the January 6th committee hearings, especially Rhonda Colvin and James Homan, Roz Helderman also with us today. And we've also heard from Jacqueline Alamany, Devlin Barrett, Amy Gardner, Philip Rucker, Mary Beth Albright, and Paul Kane, and many more colleagues all behind the scenes. So I'd like to thank you for watching with me, Libby Casey, here in the newsroom of The Washington Post. We'll see you again soon.